Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Genocrypha. I am Noel. Joining me again is JD. Hey, Noel. We just discussed in our previous episode, Rob Zombie's Halloween. Yes, we did. It should be no surprise to anyone what we're covering on this one. Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, which followed two years later on August 28th, 2009. I have to ask JD, is this a film that you had ever seen before? I have not, no. Neither have I, because I know when we covered his first Halloween on A Hail of Remakes, my reaction was much more intense back in the day, <laughs> as we discussed on that previous recording. Mm -hmm. So I had really no interest in seeing part two. I know Evie saw part two and told us about it. She was not a fan. We're going to be following again, same formula we did in the last episode. We're doing one recording session where we're watching Rob's director's cut, and then we're going to do a second recording session where we then watch the theatrical cut and we compare and contrast. What I will say up front, this isn't a case like the last film where he had his cut and then the studio did their cut. Rob had his cut of the film, and then the studio made him do a bunch of research and changes, which then became the theatrical edition. And then, based on the reception of that edition, he then made a new director's cut where he did incorporate a few of the reshoot elements, but otherwise went back to his earlier cut. So this is not like the cut that came before the theatrical cut. This is a new director's cut that came after the theatrical cut that came after his original director's cut. Okay, I just went cross-eyed. Yes. Yes. <laughs> What was nice about like doing the producer's cut and theatrical cut of Halloween 6 or what we did last time was we were still following the chronology of how the film developed. We're stepping away from that a little bit on this one because this is not technically his original cut. This is a cut that he did in response to the theatrical cut. Okay. I'm vaguely curious to see what his original vision was, but I'm not sure if I really want to see it either. We'll get into it, though. This is still largely similar to his original version. I know there were a number of other deleted scenes on the Blu-ray, but those deleted scenes also contain the reshot scenes for the theatrical cut, so I haven't watched them yet. I'm going to save those for before we get to the theatrical cut. Okay. Because I do know this is one case where the films are considered to be quite different, where I know in Halloween 1, it was just, they had the one sequence where they replaced the guards with the prison rape. Right. This one, there is entire chunks where the theatrical cut was a completely different shoot. They went back and remade chunks of the movie hmm. and also cut it 20 minutes shorter. I'm going to be very interested to actually compare these two. So I think it's a lot more comparable to Halloween 6, where, you know, they just not only stripped out a lot of what was there, but then made a lot of new stuff. Hmm. I'll be curious to see what the differences are. So not a whole lot to add about the production history of this one. It was, again, produced by Dimension Films with the Weinstein Brothers. Yep. Yep. And Rob Zombie was a producer on this one with his regular production partner, Andy Gold, who, again, did a lot of Rob's movies. And Malik Akkad, again, as the executive producer of the broader franchise. And this was written and directed by Rob Zombie. And what's interesting is there was a lot of debate about whether or not Rob was going to come back for a sequel, because he didn't really want to make a sequel, but the first film ended up being a very unexpected huge hit. Mm -hmm. So everyone kind of agreed. He was given more creative control and then made his movie, and then the studio was like, no, let's rein some of that creative control back in and remake the movie. <laughs> so it was not a pleasant experience for him. He even had a lot of bitterness just in the press around when the theatrical cut initially came out. Yeah, I think I remember hearing some of that when the film released, that he was pretty blatant about not enjoying the theatrical cut and saying, eh, just wait till the director's cut comes out on video. Yeah, because this was the era where director's cut had become a very common thing, especially with a horror movies where you had the unrated cut or the director's cut. Right. DVDs had gotten to the point where you could have the branching features where you could watch two different cuts on the DVD. Or they could just sell both cuts independently and try to make more money. Right. And of course, the director's cut is the only version that's commercially available right now, except for the initial DVD release, which I had hunted out a copy of for the theatrical cut. Mm -hmm. One other thing I did want to bring up is that we mentioned in the last episode that Halloween was the only Rob Zombie movie I'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. So just out of curiosity over the last week, I just kind of poked around and sure enough, one of the streaming channels I had had Lords of Salem. Oh, okay. So I've now seen three Rob Zombie movies, his two Halloweens and also Lords of Salem. Starring Sherry Moon Zombie. Yes. That's about all I know about it. I actually liked it. Really? Yeah, I enjoyed it. It's still grungy. It's still trashy. But what was interesting was it was him trying to do something that was more 
of an atmospheric character driven horror story. It's very much like a, you know, Rosemary's Baby or Suspiria. It's very mm-hmm. drifty, very dreamlike as this one woman is being overcome by this resurrection of witches in the town of Salem. And it still has its carnivalesque sequences, but when he goes into horror, there's some sequences in there that are very artistic, very elaborate and glossy. I mean, it's a film I'd actually very much put on a double bill with Mandy. It's a very striking film. I think Sherry Moon actually does a very good job in the lead. Again, there's choices and taste levels that Rob has that just don't click with mine, but it was nice to see him do something that was a little different than those in-your-face grindhouse-style movies. Yeah. You know, and as we talked about in the first Halloween, he can do these interesting character pieces. Mm-hmm. This one was another very interesting character piece, and it was one that I actually was quite struck by and, and did enjoy watching. Hmm. I do know that Cherry Moon Zombie was one of my favorite parts of the first Halloween mm-hmm. film that he did. That intrigues me. I might have to hunt that down at some point. And her character is really interestingly complex character. She actually does bring a very nice naturalistic presence to the role. I, I thought she was quite good. And the film was very well made. And again, as it gets deeper into the story, it starts to get wilder. But his flourishes are, I almost want to say, more like Hodorowski or Ken Russell. There's an artistry and a Baroque quality to it that was very striking and surprising. It wasn't all just like grindhouse Hmm. I really enjoyed it. Interesting. And then I also saw that 31 is available on there. I decided not to watch that. <laughs> Anyways, immediately after the events of the first film, a broken and bleeding Lori Strode is rushed to the hospital. After she's patched up and left alone, she drifts out of her room to check on Annie, who also survived, but is unconscious and buried beneath even more stitches. When a nurse escorts Lori back to her room, Michael reappears, chasing Lori through an increasingly nightmarish hospital and cornering her in a guard shack which he starts to tear down. As Michael reaches her, Lori wakes up. It's been two years since the night Michael came home, and Lori is still suffering through the trauma. With her parents now dead, she's been taken in by Sheriff Brackett and Annie. But while Annie deals with her trauma by becoming increasingly controlling, snidely mothering the two, even as she tries to comfort and support the other woman, Lori keeps flying through swings of anger and depression, lashing out at her friend because Annie's scars remind her of her own. Lori is seeing a therapist, but again lashes out when the doctor refuses to up her medication, which Lori has been taking in increasingly large doses, leading Lori to begin self-medicating with alcohol. She started bonding with two girls from work, Maya and Nancy, but it's a friendship built primarily around reckless partying and abandon. Through it all, Lori continues having vivid dreams and hallucinations about Michael, unaware that he's still alive and roaming the countryside, with a big beard and a hoodie, stopping every now and then to eat a dog or don his rotting mask to kill some rednecks. He's following the spectral image of his late mother, Deborah Myers, clad in white, often accompanied by a white horse and the image of Michael as a child. She guides him back to Haddonfield, saying a river of blood is the only way to bring the family back together again. This leads him back to the strip club where she worked, where he kills the current crew and sees his mother on the stage. Also converging on Haddonfield is Dr. Sam Loomis, who came out of the events of that night with a new book about Michael, albeit one that's stirring up tons of controversy, which isn't helped by his snide, self-aggrandizing publicity to her, which even gets him attacked by the father of Linda, one of the girls killed in the first film. He promises big revelations from this book, and on the day it's published, Brackett is horrified to read that Loomis went public with the truth about Lori's lineage, and that she's the sister of Michael, which even she still didn't know. He tries desperately to track Lori down, but it's too late as she's also already read the book, and now knows the truth. She storms out of the house after a fight with Annie, and retreats into booze as Maya and Nancy bring her to a Halloween party. Nancy sneaks off for a fuck which results in her being killed by Michael. Lori returns home with Maya, continuing to vent until she goes upstairs and finds Annie, who has once again been viciously brutalized by Michael. Annie is still alive, but only for a moment, as she bleeds out in Lori's arms before Michael again attacks, killing Maya and chasing Lori out into the countryside. Sheriff Brackett gets the call and returns home, his troops failing to hold him back from the bloody sight of his dead daughter on the floor. Everything converges at a random shack in the woods. Michael is inside with Lori, who's being pinned down by the vision of child Michael, as she's now able to see the ghost of their mother. Cops quickly surround the place, with Brackett desperate to keep Lori alive, but so caught up in emotion that he almost blows the head off Dr. Loomis when Sam appears in a sudden change of heart as he's desperate to help. Loomis sneaks into the shack and confronts Michael, realizing Lori is lost in the grip of her hallucinations. 
Michael grabs Loomis and they smash out a window, with Michael peeling off his mask and finally saying one word to his old doctor, DIE, before stabbing him down. The cops open fire, dropping Michael in a hail of bullets. Lori finally emerges from the shack, slowly walking towards the police while holding Michael's butcher's knife. Before Brackett can stop them, the police also shoot her down. We push in on Lori, bleeding out on the ground, as Love Hurts plays on the soundtrack, and we fade into the white corridor of a mental institution, with Lori in a gown on a bed as she slowly looks up and smiles. Before her is the image of Deborah Myers and the white horse. So JD, do you recommend Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, the director's cut? I do not. Zombie has a lot of vision. He has a lot of style. Not all of it works for me, but I can totally respect a lot of it. But A, this shouldn't be a Halloween film. And B, he takes a lot of the things I really enjoyed about the first one and perverts it in ways that don't work for me at all. So I just didn't find it enjoyable or necessarily even a natural extension of what we saw from the end of the first film. I'm kind of on the fence about this. There are parts that just don't work, parts where it's all ugly and trashy again. Pretty much any time we're just following Michael around killing people, it's not even interesting in how it's staged. No, there's no style to most of the kills. But there's still a lot of this film that I actually do like. I think a lot of the actual filmmaking is very nice at times. I like the character studies of Laurie and Annie and the sheriff. Mm -hmm. You talk about going the David Lynch angle, I actually thought there was some very striking work that Rob did in that regard. It's a film that doesn't all come together. I appreciate where it goes. I appreciate the choices of the past that he wants to take in exploring these characters. There's some aspects I think are absolutely compelling and engrossing, but it's very uneven because you can also feel the bits that feel like they're kind of shoehorned in like they have to be there. Mm -hmm. And again, it's still building on a version of Michael that I just don't feel as compelled by. I actually found it a very intriguing experience to watch, especially on the heels of the first film, even though I still think it's a very messy movie. Let's see where I sit at the end of this discussion. I want to lean towards recommending it. Or I should say, I want to recommend it if you enjoyed the first film. Mm -hmm. If you did not enjoy the first film, I don't think this is going to change your mind. Yeah. I think being in the middle on the first film in our last discussion kind of helps me be in the middle on this one too. Right. Let's talk about Lori. How do you feel about the way this story picks up on Lori Stroh, both kind of immediately after the first film and then when it cuts to a few years after? Well, immediately after, we jump to a dream sequence, which is kind of a fuck you to the audience, I feel, to have a 25-minute dream sequence that it does show where Lori's head is at. She's still dreaming about Michael coming after her, killing people around her, but it didn't have to be that long. But I do like that she is losing her mind. She's getting therapy. She's doing all this stuff. And she's just slipping further and further down. Kind of like Michael did in the original Rob Zombie's Halloween. Mm -hmm. Where you would get moments where she seems like a normal girl. And then she gets emotional and upset and screaming and shouting at people. She even has the line, it's like, my rage just flies to 100. Right. So I do appreciate the parallels there. It's kind of interesting, but she's kind of switched places with Annie a bit, where Annie becomes the more domestic, normal, sweet girl. Meanwhile, Lori has become more out of control. We see that she's got tattoos. She's embracing her wilder instincts. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting dichotomy between her and Annie, switching places a little bit. I actually didn't mind opening with the dream. Not all of that sequence is a dream sequence. It's kind of a mixture of things that actually happened and things that are in her mind. Yeah. Which I kind of like when this film plays with ambiguity in terms of, you know, what's really happening, what's not. It only does it a few times. In terms of the hospital sequence, I kind of liked that it was a throwback to Halloween 2, mm -hmm. but I do think it goes on a beat or two too long. Yeah. I like the scene where, hey, Octavia Spencer, hey, yeah. walks into the room and you only just realize she's been stabbed in the face and doesn't even realize it herself. You know, that's a good horror moment. Mm -hmm. I think the sequence in the guard shed is a good horror moment. I would have picked one or the other. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I don't know that you needed the whole pit of dead bodies. That's almost too much of a tip off that this yeah. is a dream. Like no hospital just has a pit of dead bodies and Michael did not have enough time to fill. I mean, he may have killed most of the hospital, but I just, eh, 
yeah, it's just, okay, this is dream sequence. But I mean, I did like the opening where it's like immediately after she's just walking down the street in a daze with the gun and Sheriff yeah. Brackett finding her. That was a really good sequence. I don't know that the whole scene of her being taken into the hospital while in hysterics and being operated on is necessary and how it lingered, but it was a good, these are the immediate ramifications of having gone through an incident like she did. Mm -hmm. Even in the dream, I liked the bits where she's like hobbling down the hall to go see Annie. Scout Taylor Compton, I don't love everything she does in her performance in either movie, but I very much respect actors who give this much to their performances and are deeply committed to them. And she's really throwing herself around like that was actually her throwing herself down those stairs, you know, as she's skidding over them with the cast. Mm -hmm. They said they had a stunt person, but she did it better than the stunt person. <laughs> I do appreciate all the energy and emotion that she's giving to a lot of those sequences. So I do think the hospital sequence is well made, even even if narratively it's overly drawn out. Right. And that's my problem with it. I think you either have Michael kill Octavia Spencer or he kills the Night Watchman. Yeah, and you could easily just have it as she's going down the stairs, it starts to descend into a surreality. Yeah. And then end with her in the pit of bodies and then she wakes up or mm -hmm. something like that. Right as you're revealing the moment where it's so elaborate that it has to be a dream, that's when she wakes up. Right. Instead of continuing to go on for another seven minutes. In terms of when we cut to two years later, it's fascinating how the Halloween franchise has become a series of alternative explorations of Laurie Strode and Survivor's trauma. Because mm -hmm. we had H2O, we had the new one in 2018, and then we have this one where it's a much more immediate. This actually reminds me a lot of the first death of Laurie Strode, the comic. Right. Finding out her family is dead. Having to now live with her best friend, whom she still loves, but every time she sees her best friend, she's just reminded of everything she went through. She has no support structure. She's kind of replaced her friend with other friends, who I basically just call faux Annie and faux Linda. <laughs> That she is in therapy that's not working. She's overdosing herself on meds that aren't helping. She's trying to self-medicate in other ways. She's just going through this whole breakdown, not only because she has the survivor's trauma and the survivor's guilt, but because she's starting to go through a lot of the same mental illness that Michael went through, mm -hmm. showing that there's this hereditary tie between the situations that they're going through. It's very compelling. There's sequences studying Lori that I think are fantastic. I think the dialogue can be a little rough, especially when she's just shouting swear words at everybody. Right. But I mean, like, Margot Kidder yes. <laughs> as her therapist was a really great surprise, not only because, hey, Margot Kidder, but those scenes were really well done. Yeah. Great acting from both of them, really well put together sequences. What did you think of those? I was like, this is really cool. I work in the mental health field. I've seen people who mm -hmm. will look at their therapist and say, she's just here to get my money. And then other people who will walk out of an appointment with the same person and say, that person is one of the most kindest, most understanding people in the world. Lori is like, you only understand me for $100 an hour or something yeah. like that. And you could just look at Margot Kidder and you could tell that's not the case. She really does care. But we're just at the point where she's not listening anymore. Right. She's just so desperate. She's begging for meds that she wants to numb the whole world yeah. so that way she's not feeling. And clearly Margot Kidder does not feel that's healthy for her yeah. and that she needs to wean off that. We only get two scenes, I think, with Margot, and they both show a lot of insight to where Lori is at this time. And I like that they're playing the frustration of the mood swings, where she'll just go from zero to 100, where it's like she'll be having a really nice moment, and then one person says one thing, not even a bad thing, but they just say it in a way that triggers her emotional response, and it's just, boom, she just flies off into this anger and this lashing out. And even then, as soon as she's through the moment, you can see that reaction to knowing that she just went too far, but she's already gone so far that she's pushed that person away. Mm -hmm. Some of those sequences are really well done. Michael was a bit different, where he would just go from quiet to just super violent in more of a fantasy mental illness way. But I think hers is a much more realistic of that bipolar aspect where you can just flip. Mm -hmm. Your emotional state can just instantly go from like happy to, ah, you know, rage. Right. Again, that she doesn't have the support structure that she needs and she's trying to find it. She's trying to find it with her friend, but her friend is just reminding her of everything. She doesn't have any parents in her life. Her new friends are just their coworker buddies. I don't want to say they're not her real friends, but they're not people who really know her that deeply or that intimately. Mm -hmm. And her psychiatrist is someone who genuinely wants to help, but there's always that cynical edge of, yes, but that's because I pay you. I really like character studies like this. Yeah. And we don't get slasher films that explore the fallout of not only being someone who survived this killer's onslaught, 
But then over the course of the movie, discovering that you yourself are related to that killer and are coming from the same place. And the journey you're going through is starting to mirror the journey that they went through. Mm -hmm. I really like what we have here. I wished we could have gone even a little farther with that, especially once we get into the third act. Yeah. I think if we actually had less Michael and focused more on Lori's decompensating after she learns her parentage and her relation to Michael. And that's actually a twist that I found really surprising that you would think, you know, having gone through this whole situation that now she would know. But that kind of revelation that, oh, wait, she doesn't know? Oh, no, she's just learning this now? Oh, no. (laughs) Right. I almost wish that that had just happened a little earlier in the story so we could have explored more of the fallout of that. And it kind of makes a certain amount of sense. Like, the two people who would be aware would be Sheriff Brackett and Loomis. And Brackett has basically becomes like a second father to her. But he's a guardian of guilt because he feels responsible. Right, because he feels a responsibility. And Loomis, well, we'll talk about Loomis, but neither one of them are in a position to really share that with her. I like that you almost go into this movie expecting, oh yeah, she would know by now. But then the twist that, oh no, she doesn't, is almost more horrifying because they don't really build up to it. It's like it just suddenly happens and then it's like, oh no, she didn't know that. Oh no. Again, we don't get enough, I think, exploration after that twist. We get her having a final lashing out with Annie and then going to the party with her friends. But by then, all of Michael's killings start to come into play. So we don't get more exploration of her mental state after now processing what's gone on. But, you know, I think part of the story is that she's not given the opportunity to process, but Mm -hmm. it still doesn't carry that thread far enough to feel like it satisfyingly explored it as well as it could have. Right. Where, again, if this film hadn't ended the way it does, I could see a part three that would pick up on that and try to sort through that. But we'll get to that later. Mm Mm-hmm. Annie. So what did you think about Daniel Harris's return as Annie? I really liked her in the first film. I mean, I've always liked Daniel Harris. She was the typical bitchy best friend, you know? Yeah, she was a little <laughs> bit of a bitchy best friend. And I like that after her trauma, she switched roles with Lori, where we mostly see her at home. She does get a little bitchy here and there, but it seems like her compensation is that she's a less adventurous. She's grown up. Yeah, she's grown up. She's more cautious. You know, she was attacked while she was having sex with her boyfriend. Well, in the way that she was found by her father in the first one. Right. You know, that doesn't seem like a stretch to have her go down that route where maybe she might be dressed a little bit more conservatively. But she's still the same character. She's not all of a sudden a goody two-shoes. It's an interesting evolution of the character. And Daniel Harris does a great job, like way more acting meat for her to chew on than she had in the first film. Yeah, and I think that's where you have the interesting contrast of the two survivors. That's where, again, I was very interested that they kept her alive in the first film. Mm -hmm. And I like that because you have the contrasting survivors. She's someone who has pretty much already processed what happened to her and is now trying to move on with her life and has grown from it. And Lori's still struggling to even process it. Yeah. Some people move forward. Some people just get stuck by it. And I like that contrast. But then also because they went through this basically together, you would think that would bring them together as a support structure. But all they do is end up continuing to hurt each other because all they do is remind each other of the trauma that they went through. Right. I'm finding that Rob Zombie is a very intelligent storyteller in terms of characters. Mm Mm-hmm. He really does dig deep into the characters and the emotions, how to build a story out of that. As I said, Lords of Salem is even more character driven. And I think he is incredibly compelling at that work. And I'd love to see him do some more work that's focused more on character driven stories. I know he's long wanted to do a biopic of the Marx Brothers. Let him. Yes, I can see that. Let him. You don't usually get something this emotionally complex in a slasher film sequel. And I always appreciate it when we occasionally do. Again, like with Jamie Lee Curtis and H2O. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. I thought the actors really brought some interesting performances. And two things about Annie. One thing, I almost like that in terms of attitude and writing, she almost feels a little more like the Annie from the original 78 film. She's got that kind of Nancy Loomis ass to her. Mm -hmm. That always makes me love Nancy Loomis in her roles. She does still feel like an evolution of the character from the first film. I just think her writing is a lot better in this one. Yeah. I like that she still has that attitude. And he's always had the attitude. Yeah. But even as she's growing and trying to help everyone move on, she's still going to give you shit and not take your shit. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Like when her dad sends the deputy to her house to watch over and she doesn't want that guy there. I even love the deputy's line of like, please don't send me there again, boss. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Because, I mean, she still has that bitchy attitude, even if, like I said, she has grown up and she has matured a bit. Yeah. When she's upset about something, she's not going to hide her feelings about it either. 
God, it was so tragically milked yeah. out the way that she died. But I thought it was, again, intelligently done how it mirrored the way she survived in the first film. Mm -hmm. Again, she's just bloody and naked on a floor. Michael came back into her life, did the exact same thing to her that she survived already, and she doesn't survive it a second time. Right. And again, that Lori has to find her that way, and she literally dies in Lori's arms, that her father has to again see this happen to his daughter. It is one of the saddest deaths I've ever seen in a slash movie. Yeah, no, it's a gut punch. Yeah. Especially since Danielle Harris really brought her A-game to the performance, and yeah. I think you really do care about her character. So when she's gone, A, it's sad just to see her go, but also you realize like this is one of the last few people that Lori has in her life that yeah. she still cares about, even if she is conflicted about that. And that was stripped away from her. And the way that it was played, going into the bathroom, just at the sink, we see Michael in the foreground and she doesn't even notice. And then just out of the corner of her eyes, she looks over and you just see that process on her face of, oh no, he's here again. Mm -hmm. And she runs and then we don't see the actual, We, I mean, we get these little flashes later on when Lori comes back to her home and the scene of the crime. Just the whole final scene between her and Annie is Annie is just bleeding out and Lori's just like, don't leave me, don't leave me. Don't leave me. Mm -hmm. And then even Brad Dorff is a fantastic actor all around, but this was one of the most heartbreaking performances I've ever seen him do when he just turns that corner and sees his daughter and yeah. the way it breaks out. And then I'll give it to Rob. Even the little flashes of the family home video of young Daniel Harris, I actually thought was very effectively done. Yeah, it could have been really cheesy. Was it necessary? No. Yeah. But I don't think it didn't work. Yeah. I won't say it worked as well as it could have, but I think it worked for the most part. Like, it seems a little out of place, but it could have been a lot more out of place. Well, and it's a great punchline of, again, this is his little girl that he's seeing on the floor. And it's like, mm -hmm. that's the image that he's always had in his head. And now this is the image he's confronted with for a second time. And just the ultimate twist of the knife of this is the second time this has happened to her. Mm -hmm. And she had just spent the last two years recovering from that first time only for it to happen again. It's cruel, but I like that it doesn't feel like it's reveling in the cruelness of it. It's I don't want to say wallowing or reveling. It's allowing the tragedy of it to fully play out. Right. It's less focusing on the cruelty and more focusing on how that affects the characters. So we see Brad Dourif and Annie both react to this horrible, horrible act. And even though, yes, she is laying naked on the floor, it never felt exploitative. No. Compared to the first film, I mean, there is a scene that we'll talk about oh, yeah. that seems a lot more exploitative, but this didn't feel like that. No. It, again, was focused on the tragedy of the moments, the horror of what happened to her. And I was, again, very impressed by the filmmaking. Mm -hmm. I wish that more of the deaths in this movie had that level of impact. Yeah. But again, her being a fellow survivor, it's a terrible fate to go on, but the way in which it was explored was very effective and very well done. So anything else you want to add about Sheriff Brackett? Brad Dourif does a great job. He's not given as much to do here other than that one scene where he's really just reacting to Annie's death. He's acting like a dad to both Annie and Lori, which I did appreciate that. But he's given less plot stuff to do, I think. What was interesting about going into the whole Annie-Lori thing, Annie's almost grown up to the point now where she's almost trying to take care of her dad. Mm -hmm. Like he's almost her kid. Yeah, you know, we all get to that point. Yeah, where she says, you're going to go eat a pastry for breakfast. 500 calories, yeah. Yeah. And she's trying to go the healthy food route, and he's just kind of like, I want my pizza and donuts. Yeah. But I like that it's a very loving confrontation between the two. Yeah, they're giving each other crap. They're not actually lashing out. Right. It's a very loving relationship still. And Lori is kind of the odd fixture in that where it's like you can see that he's trying to, again, help her and protect her and give her a place, but it's not his daughter. He still can't connect with her. Right. It feels like he still never really found that way to connect to her. She's still his daughter's friend and this person that he has this whole secret history with. Right. I mean, yeah, I love those moments where building up to the revelation of her being Michael's sister, where he sees the interview with Loomis and we don't know quite how to read his reaction until I watch the movie a second time. And it's like, that's when he's starting to get his suspicions. He's like, oh, no. Is he going to tell? Is he going to tell? And then when he actually reads the book and just his anger that Loomis spilled that secret out mm -hmm. about her relationship with Michael. And that his first thought is, where's Lori? I need to talk to Lori. We need to find Lori. But he never gets to have that moment where he actually gets to talk to Lori about what happened. And there's, again, that tragedy. Right. He is the ultimate tragic figure of this movie. 
Mm -hmm. and everything that he loses and everything that he was trying to fight to protect. Well, and there's that scene towards the end where he's confronting Loomis and he's saying, I should just let me shoot him. Just let me shoot him. Yeah. But I think there's a part of him and it's all in performance. He feels the guilt because he didn't get a chance to actually sit down and talk to Lori about this ahead of time. And so he's blaming Loomis as an easy way of skirting that guilt. Yeah. I bet you anything he was waiting for Lori to stabilize before he hit her with that. Oh, yeah. And he just kept putting it off because of how much she's going through. And then knowing that, well, this was not the way to throw it on her right when she's at her worst point. Right. You know, even his reactions when Lori is killed at the end. Where he's trying to prevent. Yeah. These are the parts of the movie, Lori and Annie and the sheriff, that I really like. Mm-hmm. Those are the bits where I'm actually leaning towards recommending this film. Yeah. Those are the parts I respond to the most as well, positive. So, before we get to Michael, though, let's go ahead and talk about Loomis. Ah, Loomis. You were like my favorite part of the first film. I know, right? And I do think there is character reason for him to become this glossy, all about money and image and all that stuff. He says, like, that's the old Loomis. This is the new Loomis. Like, he's trying to not be that guy anymore. I think he is running from being the guy who is partially responsible, at least to some people's minds, for Michael's actions. And I think that's an interesting take. The unfortunate part is I don't think it's set up well enough to really do anything other than just make Loomis look like a giant jerk for 99% of the film. I get where he's coming from, but it feels like such a cynical way in which it's played that we don't feel enough of the character in the first film beneath this that it feels too much like a different character. Mm -hmm. And again, in the very end of the movie, when they have him suddenly rush onto the scene and try to save everything, it's just, it's like too little too late. You did not earn this. You did not earn having him be a part of that. All you needed to do was have like a couple moments throughout the film where you see a beat of the old Loomis where he shows he does actually care. And this is all just a front he's putting on to escape from those feelings of being that guy. Yeah. And they just don't do it. Too much of his stuff is played as comedy. Yeah. Where it's like just him flirting with the reporters and running around with the book publicist who's like, really? Are we really doing this? He's become such a roaring asshole. And to be fair, it's basically Malcolm McDowell playing himself. (laughs) And maybe that's why after working with him, Rob decided that this is the route we're going to portray you as how I see you. I don't know. But I think back to that first film and I just always am haunted by that scene where right before he retires and he's saying like, I've known you longer than my last marriage and you're probably the closest thing I have to a friend. That Loomis is not anywhere in this film. He was, I would say, legitimately sincere. Yeah, he wrote a book. While people were accusing him of cashing in in the original one, I felt like he wrote the book for sincere reasons. Like he had this sincere connection with a patient that he was never able to help. And writing the book was a way of him processing. Yeah, purging that guilt. I know there was kind of a cynical error to some of that, but given how much of this movie is a really compelling character study, I needed more from the study of Loomis and how he's now gone from that point to this point. And yeah, that he's again using it to try to push past the guilt, that he's trying to use fame as a way to gain some semblance of meaning. Yeah. After his previous thing was not only did he fail, but then the consequences of his failure blew up and destroyed lives. Mm -hmm. He's running away from from that responsibility instead of facing it. And then you not only need to get how that leads to the point where he is willing to destroy Lori's life by throwing a secret in a book, but then how that act almost pulls him back to now wanting to regain responsibility as he goes to finally confront Michael. Yeah. I mean, that's where I almost think, did this film even need Michael and just make it where he has to finally confront Lori, who's now snapping? Yeah. Or did it need Loomis at all? Yeah. If you really just needed to have Lori learn that Michael was her brother, you could have done it in a million ways and not... I don't want to say character assassinate, but in a way, this character who in the first film was one of my highlights, and then this one, other than maybe comedy beats, it doesn't really seem to serve a whole lot of purpose up until the very end, and even that doesn't really seem necessary. It could have have Loomis die in the original film, like it was implied in the theatrical cut, and not ruin this character that I genuinely enjoyed. Yeah, and it's like every time he's confronted with something, he just has like a flippant way of dismissing it instead of seeing that it's actually affecting him. Right. When the reporters bring up things during the press conference, when the dad of Linda yeah. comes back into the story and pulls a gun on him, which I thought was really surprising, but again, it just didn't end very well. Then we also get the whole talk show. 
Hey, did you know that the best character in this film is going to be Weird Al Yankovic? Yeah. Because it's hard not to love Weird Al. That was so bad. <laughs> and I'm trying to remember, what, what was the nerdist guy's name? Chris? Chris Hardwick. Chris Hardwick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've cooled on over the years. But yeah, I know him and Rob were actually friends because he was one oh, of the yeah. actors in House of a Thousand Corpses. Yep. And he's brought Rob on the podcast a couple times when he was still doing Nerdist mm -hmm. back when I listened to Chris Hardwick. So what do you think about Michael? <sighs> um, or should I say Jason? Yeah, it's not Michael. <laughs> no, Jason was the one who was obsessed with his mother. <laughs> To be honest, I kind of got like a little bit of a Texas Chainsaw vibe at the end because you have this extended family of young Michael, the mother, and then you got adult Michael and Lori all together, kind of making this fucked up family. Which again, Pamela Voorhees, young Jason, and old Jason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm not letting that one go. He's making a Friday the 13th movie and calling it Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> There's no creativity to most of his kills anymore. It's pretty much just all brutal destruction, like stabbing and decapitation and stuff like that. Michael, he's never been as elaborate as, say, Freddy Krueger, but he yeah. usually has like a style and a panache to him that's very subtle. And this just loses all subtlety. This is just about blind rage. It's Terminator. Well, yeah. I mean, the scene at the strip club, the guy had a gun on him and like six feet of distance between him and Michael. And still, Michael can move fast enough to like get the gun, break the guy's arm. And it's just brutal for brutal's sake. And I don't appreciate most of the kills. It's just big, muscly brutality that doesn't have anything interesting. I mean, again, like, I really like that moment where Octavia Spencer walks into the room and then she turns around and it's like, as we realize, oh, she's been stabbed through the head, she realizes she's been stabbed through the head. And if she had just collapsed to the floor and was still reacting as she bled out and Michael walked past her, because he's already done his damage, he doesn't care anymore. Right. That would have been a much more compellingly tragic death than he just stands over and just starts stabbing her again and again and again and again and again. Yeah. And that's pretty much how you can describe every death is that he just stabs them again and again and again. He smashes them into a wall again and again and again. He steps on the guy's face again and again and again. I kind of like that where he just yeah, body slams the guy and then just steps on his head. But again, that felt like a very Friday the 13th death. Yeah. Nothing even feels like, I mean, what I kind of liked in the first film was he's become so detached from the world that the only way you can connect to it is violence as he's trying to pull back together the only member of the family left alive who he still loves. And again, the way that he initially became a killer was he loved his mother, he loved his sister, and he just wanted to rid the world of everything that came between them being happy. It felt like there was that drive. And here they're trying to speak to that where he has the vision of the mom saying, it'll take a river of blood to bring us all back together again. But it's like, no, that doesn't feel like that's playing out in terms of how the actual story is going. Mm -hmm. What if it's he realized that his sister doesn't recognize him? What if he can connect through her by her committing violence? Yeah. We do have this mirroring of how Laurie is struggling with how Michael began to deteriorate and struggle. But we never have Laurie having that one moment where she finally snaps and commits a violent act. Right. Again, if we're going to talk about these two characters coming together, what if it's the brother and sister finally reuniting through the committing of violence? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to bring Michael into the story, I think that would be the way to do it. I still don't think this is a movie that needed Michael. You could have just left Michael dead and have it be the story of Laurie's deterioration into becoming the new Michael. Yeah, to be honest, I half expected, especially after the dream sequence, that that yeah. might be the route they're going to go where she sees Michael doing all these terrible things, but it may be actually her doing it and her disassociating. First of all, I don't mind having a gigantic lumbering killer played by Tyler Maine with a huge hobo beard just kind of wandering the countryside killing people. But again, it's not Michael. Again, if the first film in this film had been this one killer who wears that orange paper mache mask and wasn't named Michael Myers, right? that would instantly make both of these feel a lot more fitting. I'm not compelled by a Michael Myers that's this gigantic, brutish, Frankensteinian monster who just bulldozes his way through anyone that he comes across. I like the lean, lithe, planning, mischievous I'm going to create a scene and then use yeah. that scene to horrify other people as I then use them to create. While I think it went too far, the Stephen Hutchinson, Michael Myers was so much more compelling. I'm just not compelled by Michael Myers being this gigantic Tyler Maine in a hoodie. Yeah. I don't think it's a bad visual, but it's just not interesting. And then none of the scenes built around it are interesting. Mm -mm. Like, what did you think about the farmers who just randomly come across him and then he kills him? Yeah, it seemed pointless. It seemed like because we hadn't had a kill in a while, we had to pad the body count. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the strip club, though that was far more exploitive and gross. Yeah, because we have the owner of the strip club. We have the guy who works there who gets his head stomped in and then we have 
have a nude stripper for the entirety of her death. I'm of two minds. One, I do think it was cheaply exploitative. I think there was really no reason to have this woman run around naked as she gets her head bashed in. And ultimately, there's really no payoff to Michael confronting the strip club that his mother worked at. On the other, I like the setup of Michael confronting the strip club where his mother worked at. I really like the actors who are playing the owner and the stripper and think their scenes together are really funny. Mm -hmm. I was actually surprised by, given the fact that she's naked, you don't really see that much of her, the way that it's framed and the way that she's posed. No, compared to the first one. Oh yeah, the first one, it's like he would hold them in full frame and, you know, they're all over the place. Right. This one, it's still exploitive. It still feels a little gross, at least compared to, like, say, Annie's death in this film. But it doesn't feel as bad as the first film. So I guess points for that. I also like that the owner and the stripper were actually not that bad of people. No. <laughs> they actually seemed like they were in a really kind of fun, consenting relationship. They were legitimately having a fun time together, mm -hmm. you know, especially when he pulls on the Frankenstein mask. I actually really like the scene where he's playing Frankenstein out in the park, too, you know? Yeah. And he's an actor that I've seen for years and I have always enjoyed. But again, it's like, if you're going to have this thing where Michael, you know, his mother being a stripper was such a big thing in the backstory of the first film with him finding the advertisement with her, you would think that would build to a bigger moment, but it, there's never really anything that comes out of it. Mm -hmm. Like, you never even have the owner who knew Judith Myers and knows the story was like, oh shit, it's Michael. <laughs> right. Because he was in the first movie. It was a very brief scene as he was walking yeah. Judith out to her car, but it's the same actor. I wondered if that was the same actor. Yeah, okay. He had a longer scene that was cut out of the first movie. I wondered about that because when you see that flash in the first film... He feels like a character there should be more about. Yeah, I was going to say, he looks like a Rob Zombie character that would have like a five-minute scene. Yeah. So I wondered if that was the same guy. Well, and then what's funny is the guy who gets his head stomped is actually playing two roles in this movie. He's also the guy at the party that Laurie goes to, who's kind of like the bad comedian up on stage. Oh. He's a friend of Rob, and he's also one of the co-stars of Lords of Salem and appears in a lot of the other Rob movies. I get the impression that Rob seems to have two minds when he casts people. It's either friends or people who he really likes a lot. People who starred in movies that he liked when he was young. Yeah, a lot of these guys are people you don't see in that many roles anymore, and he seems to be throwing a bone to them, and I, I appreciate Which that. Which is a quality I like, yeah. I actually like seeing actors I recognize that I haven't seen in a while. Boy, if you're a Meg Foster fan, you're going to be surprised by Lords of Salem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The strip club scene is, I like a lot of the elements, but they just don't ultimately come together. Yeah. And again, the way he's killing people is just, I'm going to step on his head again and again and again. I'm going to smash her face into the wall again and again and again. I mean, in the first film, there still felt like there was this build. Whenever he would lash out, it felt like there was more motivation to it. There was more him playing. Yeah. Him letting himself cut loose. This is just literally walking around, just killing everyone. The first one felt like a Cliff Notes version of the original mm -hmm. Halloween, but at least it kept a lot of the style. This one seems because it deviated a lot more. Mm -hmm. It also feels like it lost that great tension that Carpenter can do. It's all about the brutality and the blood and, you know, when he kills the ambulance corner or whatever. Oh, God, yeah, the ambulance scene. Yeah, yeah, where you see him hacking off the guy's throat and taking his head off. After we spend three full minutes of the guy injured in the truck just going, fuck, fuck, fuck. Yeah, fuck. yeah. <laughs> It wallows in the unpleasantness yeah. a lot more than what any of the other films in the continuity did. What did you think about the visions of his mother, young Michael, and the White Horse? This is where the David Lynchian vibes mm -hmm. come in. It seems he has something to say, but he's like, I don't want to be too blatant about it, but it doesn't feel as clever as I think it should. It's wearing its intentions on its sleeve in terms of yeah. explaining Michael's mindset. Yeah. Like it's, oh, we're going to be a family again. So we have young Michael and mom. That's fine, I guess, but it doesn't really make it feel any deeper. It just, like you said, it over explains what's going on. Yeah, and it's one of those things, given the character studies that this film has, it doesn't feel like it's succeeding in giving Michael a study. It's just right. him doing a bunch of horror sequences and then having visions of people telling him what his character study should be instead of actually just seeing this study of he had this one mission, this one goal to find his sister and reconnect with her and he failed at it. Now he's just kind of wandering around not quite knowing what to do. But then as she starts going down the same path, he's almost drawn back towards her as he could almost find this new way to connect with her. That would have been the way to go. 
Instead, it's just, Michael, keep killing people. The more people you kill, the more you will be whole again. It doesn't even make sense as a character drive. No. And again, you know, I've actually become quite a fan of Shaman Zombie. No, I this think... Experience. I've even gone back and watched a number of Rob's music videos, like Living Dead Girl, where it's kind of his tribute to the old 1920s horror movies with her mm-hmm. as the Living Dead Girl. It's nice seeing her again. I don't mind the concept of these visions, but I almost think one of the dangers of getting into Michael's head is that you almost humanize him to the point where he loses the mystique. Right. I actually don't mind that we see Michael without a mask for most of the movie. That I don't mind as much as the way in which these are explaining him to us in ways that the story is not actually conveying. Right. The masking doesn't really bother me that much. I like that he's just a gruff guy wandering around, and then when he kills people, he pulls the mask on. Right. There is a scene in the original film where you see him without his mask on for like about two seconds, but it is there. This is its own animal. This really isn't a Halloween film as much as it says it is. And so i kind of okay with it doing away with some of the sacred horses of the mask, or he says die. He actually speaks in this one. I don't like it. I actually don't mind that because his first word in years is him telling Dr. Loomis to die. Yeah. After Loomis spent all those decades trying to get him to speak. Right. I'm fine with that. Because this is almost its own animal, it doesn't bother me as much as it might have if this was the new Halloween film or H2O. Because this is what it is. But at this point, you either accept that this is very much Rob Zombie's Halloween or you don't. I joke about Pamela Voorhees and Jason having the backstory with the connection to the mother and not Michael. But yeah, if we're building off the first film, the first film did establish that relationship very well. Right. And to build off of that relationship is not a bad call. Again, I just wish that there was something more done. And I like how Michael has these visions throughout. And then it does have impact when Lori starts having the visions. That is very much marking the point of no return. Right. It does straddle the line a little bit more. It does straddle in Supernatural. Which I don't necessarily mind. I mean, the first film was very much a deconstructed version of the original Halloween film. This is much more playing it loose as far as what Michael Myers is capable of. Is there actually ghosts? There seems to be like some sort of psychic connection between Laurie and Michael because when he's eating the dog, she gets sick and throws up. Which again is what I like is they use that to set up that there is this connection. They're not overplaying the psychic connection where it's not like going full Eyes of Laura Mars where it's like we're seeing entire sequences for each other's eyes. Or Jamie from the middle trilogy. Yeah. It's playing it just enough to suggest, yes, it's there, but it's not like building the entire film off of that. Right. It's not dwelt on much. It makes you wonder, like, what's going on? There's some sort of connection. And it just kind of draws you in and then moves on. That connection is not what is driving Laurie's descent. Her descent is what's leading her into it. Right. I mean, it's not explicit, but I do think that's probably the correct interpretation. My only other issue with the fantasies is the new kid that they cast as Michael looks nothing like the kid in the first <laughs> Yeah. Like, shot. Shockingly unlike him. Yeah, and the new kid looks just like a normal kid. Yeah, he's too plainly normal. Dig had a fairly good performance. Yeah, that very striking quality to his eyes and his blonde hair, yeah. Yeah, this looks like somebody who just, well, he's close enough. I mean, I don't think he did a bad job, especially in that first scene where you see him in the flashback with Sherry Moon Zombie. There's a couple of moments where I'm like, okay, he's kind of going for the same performance. It's just that the rest of the film, he's just there to deliver, not exposition, but just lines of dialogue flatly because he's the voice of Michael Myers. I mean, there's times when I think it's very effective. I do kind of enjoy the moments where the kid and the adult Michael are almost shadowing each other. Mm -hmm. Even like when Michael dies, we see the kid lying next to him. Yeah, I thought that was effective. Or during one of the dream sequences, we see Michael in his paper mache mask and the kid in his clown mask both looking up at the same time. (laughs) I didn't mind those moments. No. I don't mind the fantasies. I just don't think they're worked into the story and the character of Michael well enough. As oddly out of nowhere as it is, I even like the whole fantasy of the Halloween dinner, where it's all these weird monsters having dinner with Laurie on the table. It's bizarre, but it's well done. It's brief enough. It doesn't overstay its welcome. Yeah. That is actually the type of imagery that there's a lot of in Lords of Salem. Hmm. When Lords of Salem goes into its wild fantasy bits, it's very elaborate, very baroque like that. 
I even like the fantasy sequence where, as part of Laurie's descent, and even building on the connection, Laurie has the fantasy of herself dressed as Michael, where Michael killed, I can't remember, Skullfuck guy from the first movie. Yeah. But it's Annie on the chair. Yeah. I like that scene, almost re-experiencing her own life through, again, building on that she has this desire to lash out to violence, this burning desire that never gets fulfilled as the story goes along, but that she's starting to follow down that same path that led Michael to finally snap that one night. And then even just the flashes of Annie and Laurie yelling at the camera. I even like that bit where it's just Laurie still in a coffin and then springs to life. Mm -hmm. I think it's very effective filmmaking and it is building on that character relationship. Those are the fantasy sequences that I like. I wish more of them could have been character and story driven like that. Yeah. Who else to talk about? Laurie's new friends. Yeah. Harley and Maya. Yeah. I've had a crush on Brie Grant since she was the speedster on Heroes. She's the more innocent of the two new friends. She's kind of the... Well, again, they're Annie and Linda again. Yeah. She's a little bit more of the Annie. Harley is more like Linda. But neither of them are really fleshed out any. They're just there as substitute friends because Annie's at a point in her life where it doesn't make sense for her to go out partying and doing this stuff with Lori anymore. So she has substitute friends. I think there's not much depth to that relationship out of deliberation because they're just the attempted replacements that Lori is clinging to because she can no longer connect to her true best friend. Mm -hmm. From that angle, it's fine, but the characters are shortly served. and Their Rocky Horror costumes were really cool. Yeah, I did find it amusing the way the wolf guy was just going along with her wanting to sleep with them. And he's just, oh yeah, yeah, hey, let's, uh, hey, this seems like it's going good. Hey, and she's just like, shut up. <laughs> yeah. And Maya's death, it's not bad, but it's very undercut by the fact that it's in the sequence of Annie's death, which is overshadowing everything else in the movie. Right. The substitute Annie is not nearly effective on an emotional scale as the actual Annie. I mean, I think a more interesting thing would be instead of killing her, have it be that she just turns and runs away and does absolutely nothing to support Laurie in what she's going through. Right. That would have been just as effective. She is a fake stand-in for the real connection that Laurie's just lost. Yeah. Actually, yeah, now the more I think about it, that would be better. I think that would have been more compelling, even more than just having Michael kill her. I, though I did like the shot as she runs outside the house to get the address on the door, and then he just yanks her back in. But again, there's nothing much to it. Mm -hmm. The whole party sequence was okay, but it was kind of typical. I, I do like the exploration of Lori's descent in this situation. Yeah, she's decided to say fuck it all and wallow in her irresponsibility and not really caring about anything because she's at that point where nothing makes sense mm -hmm. to her anymore. She's just escaping. Yeah, she just wants to escape. I think Rob needs to make an entire movie set in a Halloween party in a barn. <laughs> It almost felt more like a music video, to be it honest. Did. Especially when you get like the topless dancers and the yeah. opening act comedian. And it felt very much like the type of shows that Rob came up in. Right. And they were singing a song about Terror Train, which starred Jamie, Jamie Lee, Lee Curtis. Curtis. Hey. Ooh, well, I need Rob Zombie's Terror Train. <laughs> Maybe I don't, but maybe I do. Yeah, and I think Rob, it's clear that he's a horror aficionado. Oh, yeah. I think he throws a lot of small nods to other films that he loved growing up. Kind of like a horror Quentin Tarantino. So what did you think about the third act? The way everything came together on that shed out in the woods where all the characters converged? <sighs> I didn't care for it too much. I mean, I like the idea that Lori has either supernaturally or just plain gone insane, starts seeing Sherry Moon Zombie and baby Michael, but it doesn't quite feel like we got there naturally. Like, it seemed like we skipped a step or two. And then Loomis' self-sacrifice didn't play to me either, because like I said, he's only been an asshole the entire film. Then the sheriff shoot Lori, and yeah, she picked up a knife, which is definitely a cause to keep your weapons ready, but not necessarily a reason to shoot a girl with a knife who's nowhere near anyone else. It's a sequence where it had to pull everything together, and there's a lot that it's trying to do, but he didn't figure out how to sort it all out, so it's just kind of a mess. Yeah. The most compelling bit is Sheriff Brackett being unable to save Lori after having lost Annie, too. Mm -hmm. Loomis being present is not something that they even built up to successfully. No. And it doesn't even make sense, because he was filming that scene, because we get a timeline. We know what every day, yeah. like, it's only been, like, a day, and he filmed that scene. Maybe he's filmed it in Chicago. And he could drive well, no, we to... we know he's in Haddonfield, because remember, he did the police shoot in front of the Myers house. Right. And then he's in a limousine, and he somehow he's in a TV studio with Weird Al and oh, Chris fuck, Hardwick. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he did film that afterwards. The timeline doesn't really make no. sense, unless he filmed that maybe in Chicago. You know, I would, instead of him doing the press lecture that goes wrong, have mm -hmm. the talk show be earlier there, and the story is him drifting back towards Haddonfield, while Michael is drifting back towards Haddonfield. 
while Lori has refused to escape this place that keeps reminding her of everything she went through. Again, this is the point where all points converge. And the Loomis thread is just such a mess that I don't buy that convergence. No. And even then, the third act needed to have Lori kill in order to take that final step. Again, like, look at Jamie in Halloween 4, how you had that sudden twist end where she stabbed her adoptive mother with the scissors Mm -hmm. and became almost potentially the new Michael before they went in a different direction with part 5. Lori should have killed Loomis. Yeah. And Michael should have handed her the knife. Yeah. To be honest, I thought that was where they're going. Yeah. But the way they do it is they have Michael play suicide by cop. Yeah, Michael and Loomis burst through the wall. He takes off his mask, says to Loomis, die, stabs him, and then gets gunned down by cop. It's just not an interesting sequence. And because Rob doesn't trust the audience to follow what's going along, he has Sherry Moon Zombie say, it's time to go home now. So we know like both Lori and Michael are killing themselves in order to be reunited as a family. And it's just not played skillfully enough to be satisfying. Loomis needed to be the victim in the finale. He needed to be the one who ultimately died in the finale. But if they had killed him and then the police are confronted by this image of Michael and Laurie walking out holding hands or something like that. And she has the knife in the other or something like that. And both kicking down. Yeah. I'm trying to think of how better to stage that moment. And why is it a random cabin in the woods? Why isn't it the Myers house? Yeah. They really need to work out how they stage that sequence because it's just, it's a mess. The whole Lori being held down by the image of young Michael as Loomis is saying, no, it's all in your head. Oh, it's almost a little more Donald Pleasancy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> God, imagine Donald Pleasance in that sequence. It's all in your head, Lori, the evil. <laughs> That's ultimately where I'm kind of on the fence, because there's a lot of this film that I really like. There's specific threads that I don't, and I don't think things ultimately come together in the climax. And did you need to kill Lori even if she does take that turn, or could you have explored her in another movie? I guess we'll talk about that next time. But yeah, I think if you had made it more explicit that she kills Loomis... She's gunned down, but she survives and she becomes a new Michael. We've seen that in the comics. We've discussed that. It seems that was a route that several people have had that idea for. So I could see it. But I know the way the Akkad contracts work is you have to have Michael in every film. Right. They've never really been able to explore a story where here is someone now becoming the next Michael, the legacy Michael. Yeah. Again, Halloween 5 would have been great had they gone that route. Right. There's been films where you could play it like an actress is wearing padding or something like that. And that way she can look more like a guy in drag. No, I I would not go that route at all. I would just have it be Scott Taylor Compton wearing a different mask that still represents. I mean, again, this is where if this had been its own movie with that orange paper mache pumpkin mask, Mm -hmm. you know, I think that Michael Myers mask is way too big for her. But there's no reason a killer needs to be big. No. When I said padding, I just meant like you could have it as a prize. Like, you know, you just have Michael killing people. Oh, you mean like when they had Laurie Strode turn out to be Michael in the Chaos Comics one? Yeah. And... I'm just trying to think of what ways they could go. And none of them are really satisfying because to be honest, I think at this point, I'm starting to reach peak Halloween saturation. So I got three more to go. Yeah, I know. Four more, including the next cut. Yeah. <laughs> There's still things I find interesting <laughs> about it. I'm not saying that we've hit the limit, but it is starting to get to the point where some of it's starting to feel familiar to things that we've seen like either in the comic books or in some of the scripts that we've read or some of the past movies have kind of touched on like Jamie Strode being set up as a potential new Michael and then that not being the case. They keep going through these similar iterations, but none of them are really landing correctly. Right. My thing is, I'm fascinated by seeing all those variances because, yeah, this film references Halloween 2, it references H2O, it references Halloween's 4 and 5. It does do similar threads, but it does them in very interesting ways. And again, that's where I don't mind that the new Halloween is almost an alternative H2O because it finds a different way to tell that story. Mm -hmm. And this one is itself a variation on that. I'm fine with that. It's frustrating, yeah, seeing that multiple times certain threads are explored and yet no one's been able to pull some of those off. Like someone becoming the next Michael or the next line of the shape. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating seeing them toy with that idea and then never being allowed to explore it. Yeah. I actually did like the final bit where, again, again, Love Hurts comes on the theme, which I think got more play in this movie than the Halloween theme did. Yeah. Love Hurts comes on as we push in on the dying Laurie Strode, and then she has the fantasy of herself in the white corridor asylum room. She has that one brief smile at the camera, and then we see what she's seeing, and it's Judith and the horse. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you wanted to, you could play that she did survive, and she's now in an asylum. 
if you wanted to. I know that wasn't Rob on the commentary is like, no, she's dead. This was not meant to be ambiguous. She's dead. That's just what she's seeing as she dies. And I'm like, yeah, but if you wanted to. Yeah, it's leaving it open enough that if they wanted to bring her back for a third film, I think by the time he was done filming this film, I think he was kind of done with the franchise. Oh, yeah. Rob was done. But I mean, that doesn't mean other people can't pick up on it. Right. I was going to say, but it leaves it open enough that somebody else could take that and go a different direction than what he intended. That's where I'm going to be very, very curious to get to that Todd Farmer, Patrick Lussier Halloween 3D. I want to know how much they're actually picking up on the Rob Zombie films and how much they're retconning around it. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Interesting. But that's another episode. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else to bring. I mean, like we mentioned that the Halloween theme is not really in the movie until the end credits. I don't think the film doesn't work for that because I still think it's a good score. It's an effective atmospheric score. It does still have these nice little sudden stab of a piano clink that kind of echo the John Carpenter original mm-hmm. where you just get this sudden like, bum, bum, bum. Very much like what he used to do. So I'm fine with that. Yeah, I didn't have any problem with the score at all. It's not as iconic as Halloween, but most films are not that way. This is an entirely effective, but not necessarily noteworthy score. Any final thoughts on the film itself? No, I think we've said it all. I'm not satisfied with it. I think there's a lot of potential there. I think Rob Zombie, if he gets away from his more juvenile instincts of brutality, I think he could be a really good filmmaker. I think he is a really good filmmaker. Oh, yeah. It's just that the films that he's making are not really my thing. But I do think, like you were saying about the Marx Brothers film, I would totally watch him do a biofilm of all that stuff. I mean, I love the Marx Brothers, and I would trust him. Because I do think he's got a lot of good film instincts. Yeah. in him. It's just that, especially with something like this, he's allowed to indulge a little bit more with baser instincts that I think are distracting and I think don't always serve the story as effectively as they could. As long as he enjoys making horror movies, let him keep making horror movies, but I would love to just see him do more things. Yeah. I would love to see a Rob Zombie screwball comedy. <laughs> I would love to see Rob Zombie do a rockabilly musical. Yeah. Like, just do a full-on musical show. What's a Rob Zombie kids movie like? I mean, we just got Eli Roth just did a kids movie. Let's see Rob Zombie just do a kids movie. What would his idea of a kids movie be? Granted, it would probably be in strippers and people yelling fuck at each other, but I would still be curious to see what would happen. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, he's got enough skill. He's got talent. He's just coming from a very different aesthetic point than I am on. Right. He put a lot of thought into this film. I mean, you may not like a lot of the conclusions he came to as far as who he thinks Michael Myers is and should be and how that relates to Laurie and all that. But he clearly put thought into it. Yeah. Even if this is a film that I don't think he really wanted to make, I think he really wanted that first film to stand on its own. If you decide that there's going to be a sequel, he's going to try to make the best one he can. I just don't think this one worked. And to be honest, my favorite part of these two films are still the first half of the first film. Mm. This feels more like an extension of the second half, which to me wasn't as effective. I would be curious to see if he had stayed on and done a third one, I'd still would watch it. Yeah. But I think he ran out of things to say, even if he was trying his best to do something original and yeah. different. I think if you can step away from the way that it avoids the iconography, I think it's a very interesting film. It's a very uneven film. I ultimately don't recommend it because it's a hard film to just say, here, watch this. It's a film you have to be going into knowing what to look for. Again, if you're going in wanting to look at a fascinating character study of a survivor of a slasher film, yes, I think you will get that. I think the Lori Annie, Sheriff Brackett storyline is incredibly compelling and interesting. And even though the Lori thread doesn't fully climax, the Annie Sheriff Brackett thread climaxes on what I think is the strongest sequence in both these movies. Mm-hmm. I ultimately, yeah, the death of Annie, I will say, is the best sequence in both of the Rob Zombie Halloween movies because it is the most heartbreaking, the most tragic. It is one of the most emotionally powerful sequences in both these movies. And the building on what happened in the first film was a very emotionally moving sequence. I think they even topped it. The big problem, though, is that the Lori thread, while being incredibly engaging and compelling, does not have the successful payoff. No. The Loomis thread is just jarringly atonal, and the Michael thread just can't really tell what it wants to be, what it wants to say, or where it's going. No. From what I hear from Rob, this is a film where they kind of had a script, but were largely throwing it together as they went along. Hmm. That's why there's still even a ton of cut material that never even appeared in, because they were still figuring out this film as he was shooting it. It feels like a film where they really needed to sit down and know where they were going. 
Yeah. And to be fair, Lords of Salem, which I recommend, was another situation where they had a script, but as they were shooting, they went off in completely different directions and pulled it together in editing. And he was very successful at that one. In this one, you know, it's that kind of double-edged sword. Sometimes that can lead to great success. Sometimes it could just lead to a film that's just kind of a mess and all over the place. Yeah. It's one of those ones where it's like, I even hesitate to say if you're a fan of the first film, check out this one because there's areas in which I think that will be compelling, but other ways in which it could be frustrating, like Loomis and Michael and all that stuff. I just ultimately found it to still be a really interesting... Like I watched this film three times in prep for this episode, and I still found myself really pulled in and invested, except for the sequences where I wasn't, and I was kind of fast-forwarding through <laughs> those. Yeah. Like, again, Michael getting attacked by the farmers, you know, or stuff like that. God, I still don't know if I recommend it or <laughs> not. I really enjoyed that I finally saw this film because there's a lot more to chew on there than I expected there to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of a meek recommend. There's a lot of problems, but what it does right, it does very, very well. So that's where I'm ultimately going to kind of recommend it. Fair enough. Just because I don't like it, I can totally see the points you're making. Yeah. I think there are really strong aspects to this film. It's just ultimately, it's not my aesthetic. And I oh, yeah. think the parts that bug me really turned me off a lot more than it needed to. If you had brought back the Loomis of the last film, I think I would actually be closer to where you're at. I don't think it would have fixed the film, but I think it would have made me yeah. feel a lot more like, okay, there are things I enjoy. The Loomis thread needed to really be cleaned up. The Michael thread needed motivation. And the climax needed to more successfully pull everything together. Yeah. And those are its biggest faults. And those are big faults. Yeah. Admittedly. And even just beyond the character threads, just the performances of Daniel Harris and Scout Taylor Compton and Brad Dorif and Margot Kidder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those really made those threads incredibly compelling to me. Boy, after all the years that we procrastinated on covering the Rob Zombie Halloween movies. Because, you know, we've been off and on on, hey, JD, you want to do these with me? Not really. For years, <laughs> years, even while we were still doing the original Carpentry run, I was struggling to be like, how am I going to do the Rob Zombie movies? I don't want to force anyone to watch these with me. I was like, I don't even want to watch them. Yeah. That I came to the first film more at peace with it than I was previously. And that the second film, while it's a mess, had aspects that I was really grabbed by and really moved by. It was a surprise to me. Yeah. And then even between these two films, watching Lords of Salem and seeing a little bit more of Rob Zombie's range as a storyteller and as a writer and director, I appreciate Rob. I appreciate his talents. I appreciate the stories he's telling, even if I'm not always enjoying the ways he tells them or his aesthetic or his taste. Well said. Yes. I agree. So we'll be back with the theatrical cut of Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. It'll be shorter. It will Yay. be shorter, yes. I'm going to be very fascinated to see how that turns out. Me too. So anyways, we'll be back after the beat. Beep. So everybody, Noel and JD here. We're back having now seen the theatrical cut of Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. We'll get into some of the differences coming up, but JD, just in general, what did you think about this cut? I was really looking forward to this version just because I knew it was going to be shorter and I really didn't care for the director's cut. And I thought, well, it might cut down a lot of the zombie flourishes. I actually feel like this is a compromised vision and it feels like that. A lot of the stuff that was cut out was the good bits of personality. This feels like something that was quickly rushed out and lost a lot of the vibe that I can feel Zombie's passion in the director's cut that I really don't feel here. Yeah, I agree. But even the director's cut, you could feel the unevenness of here's the bits that Rob really loves and really wanted to explore. And here's the bits that Rob threw in there because it was expected of him. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, this cuts out all the really interesting stuff, or at least cuts it down to a point where it loses a lot of the complexity, a lot of the emotion. Mm -hmm. And it leaves in all of the stuff that I wish that they would have cut out. Yeah. So the theatrical cut is just over 13 minutes shorter. I thought it would be a little bit more than that, but that's because they actually added in some extra scenes that weren't in the director's cut, a few alternate bits here and there, and the whole climax is staged very differently, and we'll definitely explore that. But again, there's a lot of little differences, a lot of like dropping, ratting a line here and there, right. extra shots or stuff like that. We're not going to get through all that. But some of the major ones, there are some major significant changes in here. So during the opening hospital chase, I know one of the chunks that they did cut out was where Lori falls into the whole pit of bodies mm -hmm. and then tries to get a fire axe out of the thing that then Michael takes. They cut out that entire pit of bodies, but otherwise the first 20 minutes are still pretty much intact. Yeah, it removes the dreamlike quality of that opening. I think that was the first like real big clue that that was a dream sequence. I don't necessarily miss miss that, but I do think it does take away a little bit from the spookiness of that scene. Yeah. 
So one of the other big changes is it's just a single line of text, but they changed it from two years later to one year later. Hmm. Do you think that context alters anything at all? I think that makes more sense. I think Lori, where she's at in her life and where Annie and Sheriff Brackett are Mm -hmm. all at, it feels like they've gotten into a routine. They're trying to move on with their lives, but they haven't quite gotten there yet. Yeah. I think it makes more sense for there to be a little bit more time. A year later, after such a horrific event, they'd still be pretty raw. This is them coming to grips with it a little bit but still not being settled yet. Right. I kind of like some of those other references, like when Laurie was with a therapist about talking about how, you know, it's that time of year again, and this always kind of happens around Halloween, or when the one guy is told to go protect Annie, where it's like, God, remember what happened when I did that last year? Yeah, that makes sense. I like that sense that some time has gone by, even as these people are still being affected by this. Mm -hmm. I think one year later is a little too immediate. It's too little time for all those scars to have healed, both physically and mentally, and for the people to still be stuck dealing with those scars. Yeah. And for like Loomis to write a book and to get it published and two years makes a lot more sense just logically. Getting into the biggest chunk of this, let me just run through all this. A lot of it is cut out of Lori's relationship with Annie and discussions with a psychiatrist. So they basically remove everything negative about that relationship. So it's Lori complaining about the psychiatrist, snapping at Annie who snaps back about knowing exactly what she's been through, the psychiatrist talking about helping Lori's brain to heal, Lori talking about her resentment when she sees Annie's scars and worrying about being sent away, Annie being tired of always having to be the one to support Lori, Lori abusing her medication, Lori starting to self-medicate with alcohol, Lori ranting about the pig and seeing Frankenstein in the park and asking for additional medication and lashing out when the psychiatrist refuses. All of that has been chopped out. Bye, Margot Kidder. I know. It was nice seeing you for like five seconds. One of my favorite scenes in the director's cut. Yeah. She's barely in this one. Yeah, so what did you think about stripping all those layers out? <sighs> Again, it compromises what Zombie was going for. Now, you can argue with the merits and flaws of that, but he at least had an idea like Lori, whether it's biological or mystical or just because she has lived this messed up life, was drifting this way even before Michael sets a foot in the Haddonfield where she's had these issues and recovering from such a horrible event in her life, watching her adopted parents die, her best friend die, her other best friend nearly die. It makes sense that she would be raw and emotional and on the bloody edge. There's a part of her that's getting into a sense of normalcy, but she's still very much damaged and hurt from that event. This really softens a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And that underserves where Zombie goes with that, where she's somehow tied to Michael, whether you want to believe there's actual ghosts or she's just biologically connected to him or if it's just all in her head. It seems to build to her cracking at the end, and this really underserves that. Yeah. Again, what I loved was the complexity of that relationship with Annie. While, yes, to a degree, that traumatic event has brought them together and they do look to each other for support, there's also that resentment there of Mm -hmm. literally like, every time I see you and I see your scars, it reminds me of mine and what I went through. Even though what we went through was the same thing. It's that very conflicted resentment where she feels both anger at Annie and guilt at the anger at Annie. And it's a really complex relationship. Mm -hmm. And I thought that so much was the core of the story Rob was telling. While I get to a degree, I could see a producer being like, well, that doesn't make for an interesting horror movie. That's what made for an interesting movie. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest, with both cuts of this, I think the horror aspects are the least interesting part of the movie, and the character aspects are the more interesting bit. Yeah, I agree. It's a great character piece and kind of a lousy horror movie in both cuts. Yeah. Plus, this also cuts out more Danielle Harris, which should be a crime. The scenes between Laurie and Annie are great. I love that Mm -hmm. we still get a lot of the scenes with Laurie and Annie and the sheriff. Yeah. Because Brad Dorff as the sheriff was still one of my favorite aspects of the original cut. I'm glad a lot of that's preserved here. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that conflict between Laurie and Annie by removing that, by removing a lot of Laurie's breakdown. Because Laurie, in the theatrical cut, she seems vaguely stabilized until she gets the revelation from the Loomis book. Right. But in the direct cut, it's like she's already spiraling and that's the final kick off the cliff. Mm -hmm. She's abusing her prescription medication. It hasn't been helping. She's having these traumatic nightmares. She's having these deeply conflicted feelings with her best friend in the world, hating and loving her best friend at the same time and feeling a lot of guilt and anger over that, turning to the self-medication with alcohol, 
it's a very damaged, destructive character, but it's also a very painfully tragic character in, in a very understandable way, in a very compelling way. Right. And again, to lose all the scenes with Margot Kidder as the therapist, too. Yeah. Those were so good. Those were so good. Yeah, they cut out a lot of the great character bits, and yeah. that's just really the worst part of this cut, I think. It's a very uncommercial movie, and they tried to kind of make it more commercial, but it's not a movie that you can easily fix those aspects. Right. And then some of the stuff that they added were the scene with Laurie and the therapist where she's talking about missing her parents, which I thought was a nice little bit. Mm -hmm. There's a different scene with Laurie talking to her teddy bear buddy, referring to buddy in the opening scene. Mm -hmm. And then while in the original version, we had Laurie going on this very manic episode where she's talking about seeing a pig and seeing the Frankenstein in the park. We just get to play out the scene with her and the pig, and it's kind of a nice little quiet moment. Yeah, it's a nice little quiet moment. It yeah. seems kind of pointless thing to insert back into the film other than to pad out the length a little bit because it really doesn't serve a purpose. Yeah. It's kind of cute. Again, it shows her as a more stable person yeah. than what Zombie seems to be wanting to have her actually be. Personally, I think the unstable Laurie is the more interesting character to explore because mm -hmm. that's the more tragic story. In the Loomis thread, they didn't really cut much, just like a few lines here and there. But I mean, like a couple of the big ones were while he was doing his presentation before the crowd, you have him talking about Freud and how it's the fate of everyone to direct their first sexual impulses towards their mother. Or doing the whole quippy paraphrasing of George Bernard Shaw when talking about nature versus nurture. And it's like, that was more just Loomis being kind of a smartass who's not a very good psychiatrist. Yeah. There's a few lines that I noticed that they drop. I really didn't notice that during that part of the film. I don't really think Zombie's amateur psychologist analysis of... Definition of, of white horse. Yeah, I don't really think that adds a whole lot to the film, so I really don't mind losing that. Mm -hmm. It's basically making it explicit that I really don't think you really need to. I think if you're familiar with Oedipal Complex, you probably can guess that there's some of that going on with Michael, but I don't think you really need to make it explicit. Being in subtext was fine. I never really got Michael seeing his mother in a sexual way from the first movie. He definitely had a bond there, and he had a bond with Boo. And it felt more like he finally got to a point where he wanted to cut out everything that kept those three from being happy together. I don't think it was necessarily sexual, but I do think he kind of worshipped his mom because she was the only one who was ever really nice to him. Yeah. And Boo, because she was a baby. Yeah. You know, I mean... She had no opportunity to do anything. And in the first film, as soon as she did try to attack him, he lashed out at her as well. It's fine as far as like a surface level Freud-esque analysis, but it's not super deep and it's not really anything that needed to be dwelt upon. I was never fully sold on this movie using the visions of his mom and young Michael to drive Michael. And, and one of the lines that they cut is when the ghost of his mother says, we're done waiting. Only a river of blood can bring us back together. It's up to you. It's always been up to you, Michael. I always thought that was a little too on the nose and kind of a weak motive. Yeah, I didn't like that either. Some of the other stuff that they cut, like Big Lou, the strip club owner, of all the things to cut, they cut him in the park and they cut the what does a stripper do with her asshole joke, even though they still have the punchline of the joke. Yeah. Take out the trash, Arab. I appreciated that scene going faster, but this whole strip club thing just felt really skeezy and exploited for no particular reason other than just it's Rob Zombie and yeah. it's a horror film. You think that the bit with the interview was actually the most benign part of that whole scene, so I don't know why they would cut that part and not more of the skeeziness of the whole strip club. Around Annie's death, there's two major cuts. When Lori and Maya arrive at the house, the director's cut had this kind of long scene where Lori and Maya are chilling out in the kitchen, going through tea and cookies and trying to sober up, not knowing that Annie's dead upstairs. Right. They completely remove that from this one. Instead, it's just as they walk in, you see the shot of Michael walk by the window up at the top. Mm, yeah. I thought that was a nice little tense moment that allowed for a little bit of bonding with Maya, who's a character who's kind of underdeveloped anyways. Right. And the tension of they're relaxing in a home, not knowing that someone's dead upstairs. Yeah, I agree. I think that tension where you know her best friend is upstairs and either dead or dying and you don't know when they're going to come up and discover this. Zombie is not really good with tension, so to cut out one of the more tense scenes is actually a disservice to the movie. Yeah, Zombie's idea of tension is a guy sitting there going, fuck, 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 yeah. fuck, 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 <laughs> Exactly, yeah. Compared to the original Carpenter version, he doesn't get the tension part very well, but that scene was actually really good because we've really cared about Annie this whole time, mm -hmm. and knowing that they're just downstairs from her body, I don't think we know if she's alive or dead at that point that's actually one of the more effective bits that zombie did as far as like real horror 
And then what'd you think about the way they cut down Sheriff Finding Annie? Oh, that sucks so much. That was the hardest gut punch of the director's cut. I could see you cutting it down a little bit. They cut it way down. But it cut it way down. You don't get the flashbacks to the old VHS videos mm-hmm. of Annie and his memories of her. It's heartbreaking to lose. Like he gave such a great performance. And yeah, he's not the main character. I kind of see like you want to cut down a little bit, but why lose that much of it? I don't understand. Right. Other than they figured if they cut it 15 minutes shorter, they can show it an extra time at the movie theater. I loved the Sheriff Lori and Annie dynamic as this troubled, broken family that pulled together out of tragedy. Right. The best friends who resent each other, the guy who's trying his damnedest to protect both of them and to have it all fall apart so brutally. This is some of Brad Dorff's best acting I've seen. It's great filmmaking from Zombie, great acting from Brad Dorff. I just thought that sequence of him, again, not only seeing his daughter in that state, but seeing her in that state again Mm -hmm. and not able to be saved like the last time. Yeah. And just the breakdown. Yeah, he makes that guttural, like, scream. Oh, God, it. They cut that out. Yeah. And it was just, like, very human and very real. Normally, you don't get that sort of reaction in a horror film. Usually, that's too much, okay, we got to keep moving. We got to keep moving, keep the tension and the pacing and the adrenaline running. Instead, it took time just to show the horror and the devastation that happens to somebody losing somebody like that in such the worst way possible. Yeah, it just loses so much. I don't know if I would have noticed that it's missing if I had only watched the theatrical version, but knowing that it was there, it really hurts that so much. Yeah, I agree. And it's like out of a film where so many of the deaths are just empty, hollow, cheesy, nobody character deaths. To have the one major important death. I mean, I'm glad they still left most of her dying in the arms of Lori because that was powerful. Yeah. But yeah, what was compelling was, again, that so much was put on the consequence of her death, the emotional consequence of her being taken again and not being able to be saved a second time was just devastating. Mm -hmm. They really hollowed out a lot of that emotional response. Yeah. That one definitely feels like producers being kind of like, yeah, but where's the next kill, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, fuck off. So then bringing us to the climax, again, it's taking place in the shack, but by the point Loomis enters the shack, everything plays out differently. Right. Where his confrontation with Michael is a lot more brutal. Michael basically just tears him apart with a knife. And then Lori ends up killing Michael by stabbing him and then like reaching out to him and then stabbing him some more. And then she walks out of the shack wearing the Michael Myers mask, drops to her knees, pulls it off. And instead of her getting killed, it's just her kneeling. And then we push into, in the director's cut, it was that death dream Mm -hmm. of her at the end of the corridor in a hospital gown, now locked behind walls, seeing the mother and the horse at the other end. Now they're implying that, no, she's actually now been institutionalized. Yeah. And instead of Love Hurts, they put on some of the classic score. Yeah. So what do you think about this climax? I don't think it works. I don't necessarily love the director's cut ending, but it seemed to fit the story that Zombie wanted to tell. Because we lost so much of her breakdown, to have her put on the mask, it just felt completely disingenuous. And to actually be seeing the mother at the mental health ward, it kind of made sense as this is when she was going crazy, but we lost so much of that. It feels fake. It feels like something that was just rushed out so that way we could have sequel bait or something like that. Right. On the one hand, I didn't think the climax worked very well in the director's cut. There's aspects to which I think this does work a little bit better in terms of Laurie's final confrontation with Michael, Loomis's death, I think are at least better staged. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't think it works. I think, okay, if you're going to finally have Laurie, Michael, and Loomis together in a shack, do something with it other than just him yelling at Laurie, it's all in your mind, and then Michael killing him, and then she killing Michael. There needed to be more of this exploration of so much of the film has been built around Laurie's conflict of both hate and love. The whole conflict of hating someone and loving someone at the same time. You could build that to where now she is at a point where she is finally relating to and feeling kinship with her brother while also resenting and being horrified at the fact that she is now relating to and feeling kinship with her brother. And she is seeing Loomis again, this person who saved her once and had this important part to her and then betrayed her. And it's like both that feeling of, oh, it's so comforting to see you again and I hate you. Mm -hmm. There is so much more you could have done emotionally with all three of these characters suddenly being in the same room. And again, Michael being on like a zombie death march is not interesting. It doesn't build to anything character wise for him. 
there's nothing really character driven between the conflict between him and Michael, at least in the director's cut. I don't like it. The whole him taking off the mask and saying, just die mm-hmm. to Loomis. The first words he says to Loomis in decades is just die. That at least tied to the character arc between them. It needed to be more than just that whole psychedelic flash of Laurie being held down by ghosts. Loomis saying, it's all in your mind. Yeah. <laughs> God, it would be funny if like as Loomis's dying act is to actually do something psychologically useful. Right. I think Loomis in general was really underserved in this cut. They didn't really cut much of Loomis. I think they cut the line about calling the agent a lesbian. That's right. Yeah. The Red Crocs line. Yeah. They cut a bit where he flirts with the reporter in front of the Myers house. They didn't lose a lot, but for whatever reason, I think they tried to make him seem a little less skeezy, like a little less. He's still pretty awful in the movie. I didn't like this take on Loomis in general. Yeah, but I think when you're trying to soften it a little bit, it makes his reversal to actually put himself in danger and try to save Lori. When you contrast that with how he's been portrayed, I think it makes it a little bit more of a heroic act when he actually shows his true colors. Yeah. When you try to soften a little bit where, yeah, he's a little bit more money grubbing this time and he's a little bit more of a prima donna. I will admit that it's kind of measuring by degrees there. It's just that comparing the two, I do think it made it a little bit more impactful for me in the director's cut. I think the entire climax is a mess in both yeah. cuts. I don't know why it's all staged in this shack in the woods in the middle of nowhere instead of like, say, the Myers house or a hospital right. or something. Or what? Yeah. What if it all cycled back around to a hospital, you know? Yeah, it would make sense. Begin there ties into the original Halloween 2. Mm-hmm. It would seem like a logical choice to do. Like you could have, maybe they take Annie to the hospital or something like that. And she's dead. But if you really need to still have that scene with Brad Dourif. I still think it needed to be the Myers house. Yeah, I think the Myers house would be better, but the hospital could have worked. But yeah, the shack is just, I don't know why. I don't know why they chose a shack other than Rob Zombie's hillbilly influences. It just doesn't come together. And goddamn, I miss Love Hurts. I really loved the way they used that cover of Love Hurts. Yeah. I know yeah. we were kind of iffy on how they used Love Hurts in the first movie. I liked it more than you. Yeah. But I loved this cover. It's just a very sad, sad version. And I love the way that they used it in the hallway and all stuff. It's like, I think if you would use that over what happens, I don't think Lori necessarily needs to die. Right. You could have still made her surviving this encounter, but still having a breakdown and now delving into the same vision that drove Michael in a hospital is itself a tragic ending that is fitting of the character. Right. I really love that cover of Love Hurts. I wish you listened to it several more times since we did that recording. Yeah. I noticed it immediately when we get the traditional Halloween theme. It really sold the, okay, it's a callback to the original film, but it's also tragic, kind of dreamlike quality. And instead, when you get the tense do 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 music, it just feels like this is very commercial. This is a very commercial choice that we're going to play the classic music. Well, and they didn't do the classic theme. They do that kind of... You know, that quieter oh, one that happened yeah. between the main theme a lot. Yeah, it didn't fit the tone. I think you could have still had the love hurts, even if it was her alive in the asylum. And that goes back to my thoughts on the director's cut is I didn't really miss the lack of the classic Halloween theme because Rob was doing so much his own thing. Right. And this one, it felt a little jarring to have that over it. Yeah. And yeah, Love Hurts, again, just so thematically tied everything together. Yeah, no, you're right. You don't have to like the story that Zombie was telling. I don't think it really fits Halloween, Mm. but I think at least he had a vision, and this is very much a compromised result of that vision. Yeah. The theatrical version, just it was there to make money and try to appease both the fans of the original Rob Zombie film and then also the fans of the Carpenter version, and it doesn't fit for either. And even then, the director's cut is also a compromised vision because I know his original intent when he first pitched this story was to have Michael be dead and have it entirely be the breakdown of Laurie, culminating with Laurie killing Annie. Hmm. I could see that. You can kind of see, like, she's getting these weird visions. Like, in the director's cut, you see her tying up Annie, like... like Right, and you don't even need the mother and the white horse. It's just she starts seeing visions of Michael. Right. Yeah, I could see it. And is constantly haunted by it and is still struggling with the nightmares, all of the emotional complexity, all the psychiatric stuff, abusing medications, abusing the drugs, all that stuff. You leave that intact and have it be that Lori thinks Michael killed Annie when she herself did it. And then Sheriff Brackett having to deal with the fallout of this girl I protected, this girl I took in, just went down the exact same road as her brother. Yeah, that'd be a lot more effective. I don't know if I would like it. And then the big turn, of course, being, you know, Loomis is releasing the secret in the book and then that devastating emotional state. 
I don't love it as a twist, but I think if you just made this a character piece where that's really the only murder in it is the one death Mm -hmm. and everything building to that one death where everything just falls apart, you could make that work as a really good character piece. I could see Miramax Dimension not signing off on that. I could see the Akkads not signing off on that. And that's why you suddenly have Michael going around just killing a whole bunch of random people. Right. Because that's where even the director's cut feels compromised is all the scenes of Michael going around killing random people. Yeah, like the hillbillies and the strip club and all that that really don't serve to forward the plot any is just to pad the body count. So that's the question is, if you had to do a theatrical cut of the director's cut, what would you have cut? Oh, I think I'd cut down a lot of the kill stuff. I think it's just like he has this tendency to linger on the gore so much. Mm -hmm. Like the ambulance guy, that whole scene where he's just saying fuck for like five minutes. Three minutes minutes straight. Yeah. 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 And then getting his throat cut by Michael, it lingers on too long. It's excessive. Yeah. It's excessive and there's no point to it. The strip club scene where he's bashing the naked stripper into the mirror over and over again. Even like small little cuts, like when he kills Octavia Spencer and she doesn't even realize that she's been stabbed. Yeah. Like that part I really like. That's a good one. But then you go down to him stabbing her over and over again as she's lying on the ground. Classic Michael would have left her like that and just see how long it takes her to bleed out, you know? Right. He would have had this curiosity. Or at least if you're going to have him attack her, just show like the initial stab. You don't have to yeah. keep cutting to him stabbing over and over again. Every Michael death is like a bear mauling in this. There's no right. grace to any of it. No. It's very much he keeps going and lingers on every kill. Mm -hmm. I can argue the merits, but all the character bits should stay in there. Like the Mm -hmm. director's cut, the character bits are the best part. I think he's got a good handle on character. For a guy who is named after a literal zombie, he's not really good with the horror bits as much. Yeah. Again, this is where I was seeing Lords of Salem, where it's a good character piece and it was a quieter atmospheric horror movie more than a kind of in-your-face shouty horror movie. Mm Mm-hmm. I think he excels more at emotion and I actually think he's a very artistic filmmaker. But yeah, when it comes to action, when it comes to like, you know, the actual kill sequences, they're kind of clumsy. Yeah. They're heavy handed. They're underthought and heavy handed. That's a good word for it. Heavy handed. If you can kill him with one stab, five would be better. If you can show a little bit of gore, then ripping a guy's head off or smashing yeah. it with his foot is even that much better. There's an art to subtly conveying the horror that makes you uncomfortable, and he doesn't have that skill, at least not based on these two films. I mean, this is one where I would just let it be a character movie and stop trying to shoehorn in all the extra horror. Some of the horror works fine, but they're trying too hard to, you know, put in a kill every 10 minutes. Yeah. And it's like, just let it play out. Like stuff that I would cut. The hospital opening, I'm perfectly fine with cutting out the pit of bodies. I would also cut the entire buddy sequence. Yeah. I mean, I love that actor. It was a nice sequence, but you don't need that and the Octavia Spencer sequence. I think the Octavia Spencer sequence is stronger in its horror. And you can literally cut to, you have Lori run and hide in the shack and just cut straight to the bits where Michael is circling around the shack before he breaks it. Mm -hmm. He knows where she's hiding. You don't need to have any of the buddy stuff in it. I would completely remove the scene where Michael gets attacked by the hillbilly family yeah, and just kills them all. The coroner van sequence, super cut it down. Have it there just to explain how Michael escapes, but remove the let's fuck Linda's corpse joke. Yeah. Especially when you're having a movie where Linda's father shows up reacting to her death. We don't need to have coroners talking about fucking her body. Cut that. Once the accident happens, really cut down the whole lingering on the guy shouting fuck. Like, have him wake up and then, like, within, like, 10 seconds of waking up, have the van jolt and, like, you know, Michael burst his way out. And all he has to do is basically cut the guy's throat. You don't need to do the whole severing the head. Yeah. He kills the guy. He goes to the vision of his mom. That's all you really need. The strip club sequence, I actually liked Big Lou. I thought he was a fun actor. I thought him and the stripper had a fun energy to it. It was exploitive as hell. But you can completely remove them from the film. I don't mind having the strip club there to have the scene where Michael is standing at the base seeing the ghost of his mother on the stage. Because that's an image that he's never confronted about his mother. Mm -hmm. I would have done something more with it. But if you're going to leave the strip club scene in, that's the moment to leave. And if you want to, you can just have him kill the guy in the alleyway just to explain how he gets in the strip club and there's no one there. Right. That'd be, that's the guy who's locking up for the night. You know, and you could tighten that down. I actually like that kill too, where he body slams the guy and stomps his head in. I would cut that scene in half, maybe just in terms of the dialogue. Right. But I mean, all the Lori, Annie, psychiatrist, Sheriff Brackett stuff, leave it in. Yeah. I would tighten up the Loomis stuff. Again, you don't need the talk show and the news report and the lecture 
I would just do the lecture followed by the book signing. Because mm-hmm. the lecture is where you have him being very pompous and then melting down. And then the book signing with the confrontation with Linda's father. Part of me would miss having Weird Al in a Halloween movie just because of the I novelty know. of that. But I kind of agree. It didn't really serve a purpose other than to reiterate, hey, people think that you're exploitive of tragedy, something that the book signing and the lecture already had served. Right. And then some of the sequences between him and the publisher, because, you know, that's where she has the whole thing about how you're actually messing with people's lives as the setup for him revealing the thing about Lori. Mm -hmm. I would cut down the whole scene of Lori losing one of her friends who is fucking the wolf boy in the van. As amusing as that scene was, because the guy who played the wolf guy was hilarious. Yeah. It all goes on too long. Again, you kind of need to explain what happens to that friend, so I would just cut it down. You don't need to have the party go. I mean, the way the party played in theatrical film, they did tighten it up so it's not just, let's spend three minutes watching this musical act on stage, which was in the director's cut. Mm -hmm. They cut down the host of the party, who was the same actor as the guy who got killed in the alleyway, even though they were trying to hide it, because he's one of Rob Zombie's friends. That same actor is also in Lords of Salem and 31 and like all of his other ones. It's something that I can see in a director's cut, why it's as long as it is in there. I do think that for a theatrical version, you probably need to cut down that scene. Right. I would leave that extra scene with Maya and Lori in the kitchen. I thought that played out well. Again, leave everything in involving Annie's death. Leave in the sheriff's finding her. Leave all that in. Yeah. After that, it gets tricky because I don't think the third act of the movie is good in either cuts because, you know, it's the whole Lori running away and then the guy finds her on the road and then they tip the car over and... That's not really an important scene. It kind of explains how Laurie ends up in a disheveled state. If we're still stuck with the footage we have, yeah, I would maybe leave that in just for extra beat, even though it's a cheap beat. And for the climax, God, I would be like, I want to take parts of the director's cut, parts of the theatrical cut. But it'd be hard to do because I want the Michael saying die to Loomis, but that happens outside the shack. So you can't keep that and Laurie stabbing Michael in the shack. Mm-hmm. So that would be tricky. And in terms of does Lori die or does she kneel on the ground with the mask, I would go with the kneel on the ground with the mask because I think that was executed better. I don't think her being gunned down was shot very well. No. But I would still play Love Hurts and I would still have the whole ending in the corridor. Yeah. So it's like there's a lot that I wish they had cut from the theatrical cup. They left everything in that I would cut. Right. Yeah. A lot of the stuff that I missed the most was in the director's cut. So I guess I'd lean more towards that version, I guess. Yeah. But both of them are flawed. I mean, I enjoyed the director's cut more than you did. So I'm obviously going to recommend that one. Yeah. If I had to, that would be the one I'd say I'd recommend. Yeah. I do think both of them are flawed. I think both of them. There's some really solid ideas in there. I really like the idea of exploring the psychology of somebody who survived like yeah. the worst night ever. We got that with H2 on the new Halloween of like exploring Lori years down the road, but still in the more immediate survival where the wounds are still fresh. Yeah, you don't usually get to see that in any sort of film, horror or otherwise, to deal with the aftermath and how do you move on and yeah. the psychology behind that. There's some really good ideas there. I just think he was kind of limited just because of the nature of the material he's adapting. Mm-hmm. Again, if this had been his own property, if we had gotten... Paper mache pumpkin mask killer, yeah. Yes, if we had gotten the paper mache pumpkin mask killer instead of Halloween Michael Myers, where he would have more freedom to explore... I think this could have been a fantastic film. Ooh, ooh, ooh. If he did that original one, then Laurie makes her own paper mache mask out of torn out pages of Loomis's book. Oh, ooh. yes, yeah. I could see that. I could see that working. It's just a shame because he has some really good instincts. Oh, yeah. He's got a good eye for film. And for a guy who was known as a musician, like he's really a good filmmaker. It's just... He's very impulsive, though. Yeah. He needs an editor, and he needs material that is not limited like Halloween or any other type of film. I know you kept comparing it to Friday the 13th. I think I've made some comparisons to Texas Chainsaw, but I think that he would be best off where if he could just explore his own stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like his version of Hatchet, where it's like Hatchet is essentially a spin on Friday the 13th, but they kind of did their own thing with it. Right. It's like, yeah, just do your own kind of thing with it. This could have worked. File off the serial number so that way no one can say it's a Halloween remake. Exactly. Irredeemable, that shit. You could have easily have done a really good film and instead we get, again, I keep using the word compromise. That's what it is. I really regret Zombie not being allowed to do more of what he clearly wants to do. But at the same time, I think he also still needs an editor. I think he needs somebody to say like, okay, let's just shorten the scene by half and go from there. Yeah, I think he's impulsive and he's indulgent. Yeah. But again, he's also very inventive. He has a great visual eye. He has a lot of heart and emotion to his Mm -hmm. filmmaking. 
his Halloween movies, I'm glad we finally revisited them because I know I hated his first Halloween for years. I was very much dreading revisiting them. That's why we put this off for so long during Masters of Carpentry. But I'm glad to revisit them because I can now have the distance to actually step back and say, while they're not ideal Halloween movies in their own right, they are very interesting movies, but both are also very uneven and compromised movies. And not only compromised by the studio, but also compromised by Rob's own impulsiveness and indulgence. Yeah. But I still think there's enough to both of them because the first film, I do think the exploration of young Michael has enough really interesting stuff, especially as he's degenerating in the hospital and the scenes with him and his mother are really captivating filmmaking. And the background plot of Annie and Sheriff Brackett in both movies. And again, just the character study in this movie. They're both messes of a movie, but there's a lot of really interesting, compelling stuff in them, in their own right. So that's where I'm glad I finally had the distance to actually sit back. I can appreciate them more. I especially appreciate number two for doing something really interesting and unique, even if it's even more of a mess than the first one is. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. In some yeah. ways, it was even more ambitious than the original because it wasn't just trying to remake another film, especially since Rob spent half the original film that he did telling a new story with the background of Michael and then quickly remaking the original Carpenter version in half the time, losing a lot of the tension. It's an interesting trilogy, but the problem is the first two movies were all squished into one. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Getting into the box office release, Halloween 2 came out on August 28th was an interesting time for a Halloween movie. <laughs> Other movies that were already out at the time, we had Inglorious Bastards at number two, District 9, Julie and Julia, G.I. Joe, The Rise of Cobra, The Time Traveler's Wife, and Robert Rodriguez's Shorts. <laughs> I didn't even heard of that one. That was another one of his kids' movies. Oh, okay. So Halloween 2 opened at number three. Hmm. At number one was The Final Destination, which I can't remember if that was part four or part five. I think it might be part five. I won't swear by it. But yes, a Final Destination sequel did better than a Halloween sequel. Not hugely surprising. So in its second week, Halloween 2 dropped to number seven. Oof. And that was the week that Gamer, the film from the makers of Crank, opened at number four. <laughs> and All About Steve opened at number three. I don't remember what All About Steve was. I don't recall. In its third week of release... Halloween 2 dropped to number 14. Wow. Yeah, it did not stick around long. Opening that week were Whiteout and Sorority Row, another slasher movie that opened at 6 and 7. And then opening at number 2 was 9, that animated film. Okay. And opening at number 1 was Tyler Perry's I Can Do Bad All By Myself. That is certainly likely a film. Yes. I don't begrudge Tyler Perry. I've never seen any of his films. Seems like a lovely guy. I don't know. Oh, yeah. They don't interest me, but if people yeah. like him, good for them. So in its fourth week of release, Halloween 2 was at number 17. Oh, jeez. This is the week that Jennifer's Body opened at number 5. I'm glad to see that one's developed a cult following, because I know it was trashed when it first came out. Yeah. We had The Informant at number 2, and opening at number 1 was Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. I've never seen that, but I've heard that it's a really good kid's film. I just saw it for the first time a couple months ago. It's really good. That was the first Lord Miller movie. Okay. Very sharp, very funny, very colorful. That will probably cut off here, because in its fifth week of release, Halloween 2 was at number 28. Wow. I wonder if it was word of mouth or was it because it was out like we had the other fight on Destination film and maybe there's just too much horror crowded around the same time. Well, I think also when the first movie came out, there was a lot of curiosity to it because Rob Zombie was at his peak after Devil's Rejects. Right. And it was a very polarizing movie. True. And I think Halloween 2, there were a lot of people who were already actively against it. And then seeing this theatrical cut where it's pretty much all nasty horror and the character stuff's been shortened. I could see why it didn't really hook people or get much word of mouth. Right. So in that final week, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs remains at number one. I know that was a huge hit. The Bruce Willis sci-fi movie Surrogates opened at number two. That's actually not a bad movie. The comic book is really good. Yeah, I watched the movie. It's not bad. At number three was the remake of Fame. I haven't seen that. Remember that happened? I remember it existed. I couldn't tell you anything about it. Who was in it? Who directed it? Yeah, and at number five was the sci-fi horror movie Pandorum, which I wanted to at least give a shout out to because I really like that movie. <laughs> it's a nice oddball sci-fi event horizon type movie. Hmm. I'm just curious to see why they didn't release this in October. And I'm just scrolling through. Let's see what came out in October, the horror-wise. Oh, Zombieland came out at the beginning of the month. Oh, wow. I know that was a big hit. Yeah, I like that one a lot. Oh, the Stepfather remake, which I don't remember that one doing very well. 
Where the Wild Things Are. I could see that being a good family Halloween movie with all the monsters and everything. Yeah. Antichrist. Oh, boy. There's your intense indie horror movie of the period. There you go. Yeah. Oh, Cirque de Freak, the Vampire Assistant. That bombed. <laughs> Saw 6. Oh. See, there's your big tentpole. Yeah. Because remember the last Halloween opening against Saw 4? Yeah. I could see them wanting to get some space between them and Saw. Who is a remake of Night of the Demons that year? I didn't even know they did a remake of that. Hmm. And what's a Halloween night? Obviously, it didn't do well because I never heard of it. House of the Devil, that was an indie one. I could see, yeah, the two big ones that season were Zombieland and Saw 6, which was still making a ton of money. Yeah. The Saw franchise, I mean, well, we got six of them by that point. <laughs> I think we're up to eight now. Yeah. Because then we had Saw 3D and then Jigsaw. Oh, yeah, you're right. I like the first few, but to be honest, I would actually much rather watch more from Zombie than I think I would want to watch more from the Saw franchise. Well, what's going to be interesting is we're going to get to a Halloween script here soon written by the guys who wrote Saws 4 through 3D. Hmm. And I just watched one of their films, The Collector, which was actually a very interesting film, and I'll bring it up when we get there. Okay. Zombies Halloween 2, it cost $15 million to make. It ultimately only made 33, so it still doubled its budget, but this is a time when that doesn't really mean that much anymore. Yeah. It kind of killed things, and as we'll be getting into, there were plans for a Halloween 3D, where it was another creative team was taking over, but it was still going to be a sequel. There was plans for a reboot by some of the Saw guys, and then we got to what would be the ultimate reboot that we'll be covering here soon. And speaking of, we got some feedback on Twitter when I was just kind of asking some people what they thought about the Rob Zombie movies. And one of the people who chimed in was Alex, co-host of Masters of Carpentry. I think I've heard of him. Oh, yeah. We'll be having him back on here soon when we actually get to the 2018 Halloween movie. So he wrote, it's been a while, but I disliked the first film because it made Michael a Frankenstein wrestler with too much focus on his time in the asylum. The second had a unique POV and some great dream sequences, so I appreciate it more. Mm. And yeah, I gotta admit, in Halloween 2, I didn't really need them to bring back Michael going, <laughs> Yeah, they do a little bit too much with, even if he's not speaking, he's still doing a lot more vocalizing than he needs to. I've never been a fan of that. So Tim, the co-host of Cinema Spectrum, which is a very fun podcast, he said, I appreciate how Zombie presents a different take on Michael Myers. We all know Myers is a cipher who kills with no explanation or apparent reason, so giving a more realistic take on how the character became who he is due to an abusive home is novel and not without merit. Unfortunately, I feel like Zombie falls back on his usual profanity-laden dialogue and quote-unquote edgy characterizations, even for Laurie Strode, and the use of horror actor cameos becomes distracting. I don't know, I kind of liked all the horror cameos. Yeah, I don't think they're too distracting. I mean, there's a few times where I was like, oh, it's, hey, that one guy, or, hey, there's Udo Kier, or whatever. But for the most part, they seem like they all fit in a Rob Zombie universe. So I right. never found them too distracting. I mean, because again, Danny Trejo actually had a good character story. Margot Kidder actually had some really great sequences. I didn't mind it. Rob Zombie's kind of like the grindhouse Joe Dante. Yeah. It's just a fun little extra layer that it's not distracting for me. He usually gives them all interesting things to do. Mm -hmm. So Michael of Earth2.net said he quite liked Zombies Halloween 2, and he linked me to an episode of his podcast where they discussed the entire Halloween franchise. And I did give it a listen. When they were ranking all of the various sequels that came after the first Halloween movie, he actually had Halloween 2 as his second favorite. Hmm. And that's entirely because of the character study of Laurie Strode and all that. Yeah. Not my choice, but I, I totally could get that. His co-hosts were not on board with him on that. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Michael, I think I'm more in agreement with you on that, even though it's a very uneven movie. And then Halloween 1 was everyone had it kind of more in the middle as good stuff and bad stuff. Very uneven. Yeah. But it, it was a very interesting discussion to hear them run down the franchise. And then one of the points that they brought up that I'd be curious to get your opinion on, they were actually critical that these films had Daniel Harris in them, but didn't cast Daniel Harris as Laurie. Do you think that's something that they should have done, or do you like her as Annie? I think I like her as Annie. I think it would have been too on the nose to bring her back playing Lori when yeah. she was Jamie, and that's too cyclical. Yeah. I think she could have done it. She still looks like she's 18, even if she's very much not. I do think she is a better actor than Scout Taylor Compton, but I think it would have been distracting, and I think it would have been a little bit too clever. Yeah, I'm perfectly fine with her as Annie, because I think she really gave a nice edge to Annie that not only captured the sarcasm of the classic Annie, but also, again, especially in two. 
I think she was a very underdeveloped character in the first movie. But again, that she probably had the most traumatic, I don't want to say death scene, but the most traumatic aftermath sequence in the first movie where she survived right. everything that happened to her and her father finding her and all that. And then to have everything in the second movie, I thought all of her confrontations with Lori were great. She is a very still sarcastic character, but she's not cruel. Mm -hmm. She's very much a character who is still going through her own stuff. And I thought she really brought a lot of great stuff to that character that, again, made her final death even more traumatic. As Laurie, what I liked about Scout Taylor Compton, who again is an actress I would like to see in more stuff, I like the intensity that she brought to her performance, both physical intensity, the emotional intensity, that she really poured a lot into her performance as Laurie. I don't know how well that would have come. I mean, we kind of got a sense of that in Halloween 5 when we saw Daniel Harris. It was a terrible movie, but you're really pouring a lot of intensity into that traumatized performance. Mm -hmm. So I think Daniel Harris could have pulled it off just as well, but I don't have any problems with Scout Taylor Compton as Laurie. I have problems with the script sometimes, but... Right, and I still think that Daniel Harris is a better actress, but I don't mean to say yeah. that Scott Taylor Compton is bad. I think she actually did a really good job with the role. But I think she got a little bit more of a meteor role by playing Annie, just because you get that tragedy yeah. of... For one thing, she was maybe not the party girl, but she was very much more of a wild child than yeah. Lori was. And then she becomes the more matronly. She never leaves the house. She cooks. She watches after Lori. She runs the household, yeah, basically. Yeah. Even her dad. <laughs> yeah, so... I think that gave her a little bit more to do. And with Scout, I always respect actors who pour a lot into a role, like mm -hmm. physically and intensity-wise, all the stuff she put herself through in the climax of the first one, in the whole hospital chase. Not only the physical intensity, but again, the emotional intensity that she gets into with her breaking down arguments with Annie and with the therapist. Again, the scenes between Scout Taylor Compton and Margot Kidder are, I think, some of the best in the entire movie. Yeah, I agree. I get the impulse to want to cast her. I'm more pissed that they didn't cast her as Jamie Lee Curtis's daughter in the new Halloween. I think that would have been great to have a universe where they weren't separated. <clears throat> Dang. Yeah, you're right. We'll discuss that more when we get to Halloween 2018. Not that I dislike Julie Greer, but if you're no. doing a what if alternate universe, a universe where that mother and daughter never got separated. Yeah, that makes sense. And then the last comment was from Eric Allen Johnston, who's an illustrator and co-host of the podcast Mystery Movie Night, which he does with Michael May, my co-host on Greystoke and Thunder Road. He said, I've seen pieces of the first on TV. I've been told the second one has some trippy visuals that would make for a good Halloween party background. Yeah. There have been a lot of fan music videos for Halloween, too. <laughs> I could see that. I could see this would be a good thing to have on with maybe the volume down and then just let it play out. I don't know the entire movie would because you just have like a lot of the dreary kill scenes. You have all the character stuff. But yeah, if you like compile all those visions, like, you know, the black and white vision of the weird abstract Halloween dinner party mm -hmm. with, you know, the pumpkin headed people sitting around the table or parts of the party. Yeah, I the could party. See. Yeah. yeah, there's bits I could see that would fit well as background visual for a Halloween party. Yeah, even the whole Love Hurts ending. Oh, yeah. Again, there's been quite a few fan music videos of both Halloween and Halloween, too. There's enough interesting visual stuff in both of them. So that's all that I had for feedback. I mentioned that I had already seen Lords of Salem. I also found out that the same free streaming service had 31, Rob Zombie's most recent film and the film he did right after Lords of Salem. It's the Kickstarter film that he crowdfunded. I'm willing to take a break away from Rob Zombie after this one. <laughs> it's not that it's terrible. It had its fun moments, but it was a bunch of traveling people on a road get kidnapped by this underground society that challenges them to survive several layers of killers. And if they can survive for 12 hours, they're set free. And it's all overseen by Malcolm McDowell in like over the top Victorian outfit with like a big powdered wig and everything. Okay. They have to go through like, here's the rape dungeon of the Chainsaw Brothers. Oh. Hey, hey, JD. Have you ever wanted to see the breasts of the woman who does the voice of Tommy Pickles? Uh, no. To be fair, E.G. Daly is a very attractive woman. But still, it's a little strange. Yeah. To see her as basically a Harley Quinn character. Okay. I feel weird about this film, and I have yeah. never seen I mean, I've heard of it. I think I may have listened to a review of it, but I completely forgot it existed until you just mentioned it. You might be shocked to learn this. The lead is Sherry Moon Zombie, <gasps> who, again, is fine. It's an underwritten role, but I've never had a problem with Sherry Moon Zombie that other people No, have. I think she's a good actress. I just think he seems to rely on her for all of his films, which I'm glad that he has a great relationship with her where he can work with her and have a relationship outside of work. Yeah. I just don't know if you necessarily need to do that for every single one of your films. And the bouncer who took out the trash in this film, he's one of the leads, too. He was also one of the leads in Lords of Salem. 
I think he's a perfectly fine actor. I just didn't like his scene in this movie. Mm. And uh, Meg Foster, in here, she's very much uh, Linda Hamilton, I'm going to kick ass and take some names, I just ran out of bubblegum type of character. <laughs> and she's, again, like a 70-year-old woman who's kicking ass and is awesome. That's cool. That's a little bit more of a sell than anything else you said. Makes me want to see her in more stuff now. Because I've always been a fan of Meg Foster. She's always been a very good actress. Oh, yeah. Always very striking because she has these colorless gray eyes. Yeah. It's a very messy movie. It's very much Rob just wanted to do a lot of fucking nonsense to try to raise money. And so it's just like a lot of chainsaw rape dungeon or one of the first killers they have is a Mexican little person dressed as Adolf Hitler, Hmm. who, to be fair, gives a great performance. I want to see him in more stuff. But it's Rob just being an impulsive provocateur. Yeah. Didn't you say he wants to make a Marx Brothers biopic? I think he would still make a great Marx Brothers biopic. I would much rather donate money to him making that than what you're describing. I mean, I'm sure it has its audience and I'm sure there's a reason why he went with that one for a kickstarted film. I mean, here's the thing. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It's just him pushing as many buttons as he can. It's very juvenile. It's a very juvenile movie. Yeah. But it's still very well made. Like all the design and all the actors are really interesting, the costumes and everything. It looks nice, but Lords of Salem, what was nice was it was him building on Halloween 2 and doing a very atmospheric character study movie Mm -hmm. with these artistic elements of horror. I would love to still see him explore other things. And this was kind of him just going back to House of a Thousand Corpses. Yeah. And then I know his next film, which he's just finishing up, is another sequel to Devil's Reject. So he's just still doing that. Which, I mean, I get that's where he made his name. And I can see like going back to that well. I mean, Kevin Smith is making another Jay and Silent Bob film. I mean, I get it. But at the same same time you kind of hope that they would grow past doing that same thing and like i said he's got some really good instincts when it comes to character and stuff i really would like to see him get out of the horror ghetto yeah he's a filmmaker that i would love to see pull himself out of the niche yeah i get it you know and, and hey if he genuinely enjoys making these movies then all the power to him but again, it's like we saw that with John Carpenter, where John Carpenter got to break out of that style of films and actually got his opportunity to be an A-list studio filmmaker, and it all failed, and he got stuck making all that stuff for the rest of his career. Mm-hmm. You know, again, like doing the Joel Schumacher series, where Joel is intentionally trying to do as much variety of different kinds of stuff as he can. I always appreciate it when filmmakers push themselves to try to constantly do different things. Yeah. I love it when a filmmaker steps outside their brand for something. I mean, look at Robert Rodriguez does have a large variety of his Westerns, his horror movies, his action movies, his kids movies. Mm -hmm. I would like to see Rob push himself more, experiment more because he has talent. I think he has genuine talent. Yeah. Again, I'm not saying 31 is a bad movie. In some ways it is. It's not a very well-constructed script. It's kind of a mess of a script. The actual action horror sequences are not that well directed. They're, again, clumsy and heavy handed. But again, a lot of the character stuff is interesting. It's just of a taste and of an aesthetic that just doesn't appeal to me. More power to him, but it's just not my thing. Yeah, and it doesn't sound like something I'm going to rush out and try to find either. I did Flag House of a Thousand Corpses of Devil's Rejects should they show up on a streaming service that I have. Mm -hmm. Maybe one day. But anyways, that about sums up my thoughts on Halloween 2. J.D., Thank you for agreeing to do four recording sessions for these two (laughs) movies. The two movies we were dreading getting to. Yeah. I had good memories of the original Halloween. I mean, mostly. I knew it was a flawed film. On one hand, I think this has made me appreciate him as an artist a lot more. On the other hand, I don't love that original as much as I did the first time. And I think that he needs to get out of doing those type of films. It's both made me respect him more and wish that he could do better. Yeah. I've always known about the flaws of Rob Zombie as a storyteller and filmmaker since I saw the first Halloween, but this journey made me appreciate more of his genuine skills and his genuine strengths as a filmmaker and a storyteller. And again, not just revisiting these films, but watching Lords of Salem. I actually did watch a chunk of his music videos, and some of those were really interesting. Everybody's fucking on a UFO is hilarious. (laughs) I'm going to have to track that one now. Oh, it's kind of terrible and hilarious and has a lot of dong. <laughs> it's a surprising amount of dong for something that's on YouTube. <laughs> okay. I think he has genuine skills. And again, I don't want to dismiss his rockabilly burlesque aesthetic mm-hmm. where everything is kind of grimy and skeezy, but also be very colorful and carnivalesque because that's a genuinely valid aesthetic. And there are times in which it's really compelling and interesting. 
But there's also times when he just falls into excess and exploitation and very juvenile. I mean, I'm not trying to dismiss provocateurs. I don't mind people who push buttons. But when you're just doing it in a very juvenile way. Yeah. Like, here's the Chainsaw Brothers with the Rape Dungeon. Yeah. And he doesn't have anything more to add other than that. Yeah. It's fine. But we're both at this point where we've seen that sort of thing before. Oh, yeah. I was a teenager once. Yeah. It's something that teenagers and people who are just getting into horror yeah. might appreciate a little bit more than... And you or I, and I haven't even seen that many horror films, but I've seen a lot. I can enjoy that thing in short bursts, but I don't necessarily need all of it over and over again, which is kind of what Zombie's done. Like I said, I respect him a lot more now. I just hope that he grows past this and does something else. Well, and even then, if it's what he likes to do, but I, I just want him to have more range. Yeah. If he wants to do these kind of films, God bless him, go ahead and do it. But I would love to see other stuff amongst that. I want to see him do a Western. I want to see him do a road trip movie. I want to see that Marx Brothers film. I want to see the Marx Brothers movie. I want to see Rob Zombie do a Marx Brothers movie. I had a joking thing with my friends where we were watching a Nicolas Cage double feature. And I'm like, you know, I would love to see Nicolas Cage star in a reboot of Grizzly Adams as done by Rob Zombie. And everyone reacted with horror and I was being sincere. <laughs> I just want to see what that would be like. Yeah, I would be interested in watching that. I don't know if it would be good, but it would be interesting. That's the biggest thing is I don't love any of the films by Rob Zombie that I've seen. But they're all really interesting. Yeah, which is a lot better than so many disposable horror films where somebody mm -hmm. is just there collecting a check. You could tell, like, Rob has a lot of passion. He puts a lot of thought into his stuff. You don't necessarily have to agree with his aesthetic or his choices that he makes. I do have to respect that he's a talented filmmaker and does not half-ass it. And people really need to lay off the whole bashing Sherry Moon Zombie for being in all of his stuff. I get that nepotism is a very easy button to push, but it's like, I don't really care as long as someone is actually worthy of the position they've been given. Yeah. I think she's a fine actress based on at least these two films. She's perfectly fine. She's fitting both the roles that she was given here. I would like to see her again do pretty much all of her acting has been in Rob Zombie's movies. I think she's only done one film that wasn't by Rob, mm. the remake of The Toolbox Murders, which I haven't seen yet. But she's someone who I would also like to see just expand her career. But again, you know, if the two of them want to just keep their collaboration close because that way they don't have to part, they don't have to have long distances between them, they want to keep their relationship together, more power to them. I've never had a problem with filmmakers casting like their spouses or their children or stuff like that, as long as it doesn't suck. Right. There's a lot in the list of filmmakers who just cast their friends. Kevin Smith just hires all of his friends to yeah. do stuff. It's a long history. It's the fact that she's an attractive woman and there's some people who just want right. to dismiss her because she's sleeping with the director. Well, yeah, right. who cares? Based on these two films, she's a fine actress. Yeah, I don't think she's a great actress. No, but she's acting. She's putting effort into her performance. Yeah, and all those scenes with her and young Michael in the asylum were great. Yeah, oh, she was great in that. She doesn't have much to do in Halloween, too, because she's just the ethereal presence. Right. But like Lords of Salem, again, where she's the lead role in a very character-driven, moody, atmospheric piece, she's great. I don't have a problem with it. Rob Zombie is a filmmaker who I understand why people have their biases against him. To a degree, I think they need to overlook that. And to a degree, I think he needs to stop playing to that. Yeah. It's complicated. Yeah, it's a strange line, but you're right. I think he can be better. But at the same time, he's shown a remarkable amount of talent for somebody who hasn't directed. I mean, he's directed quite a few films One, by this two, point. One, two, three, four, five, six now. Yeah. He's got a seventh coming out. Which is not too bad considering he's not been doing it for that long. That's not bad for about 15 years. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's going to wrap up our thoughts on Rob Zombie's Halloween. Yeah. And a lot more than I thought we were. There's a lot of meat to both these to discuss. Yeah. What are you hoping for from Halloween 3D? I'm not sure, because I really don't see with either ending where they would go. Mm -hmm. Since Michael is dead, but we know that the Akaz will not let Michael be dead. So yes. I kind of expect them to go a more supernatural. Coroners will be wheeling off the body. Yeah, to fall into the more traditional Halloween formula mm -hmm. a little bit more. I hope that it's a little bit more than that, especially if you're going to be building off this universe. I would hope that they keep a lot of the characterization and presuming that anyone comes back, most of the main cast dies in this film. I mean, there's still enough wiggle room that Laurie could have survived, especially the theatrical cut. Yeah, Laurie could come back. Sheriff Brackett's still alive. Mm -hmm. You could always just say Loomis survived. That wouldn't be the first time that they've <laughs> done that. I don't think he would survive the theatrical cut. Yeah. They pretty butchered him up in the theatrical cut. They bear him all them. Yeah, but then again, he was set on fire in two, and only walked away with a light bit of scarring. The fire only grazed him. <laughs>
that's only a flesh wound. So there's a lot of openness as to where they could go with it. I kind of hope that they keep a lot of the characterization that Zombie had and maybe back off some of the more excessive violence, though I have a feeling it'll go the other way around. It's Todd Farmer and Patrick Lussier. It's the guys who did Jason X, My Bloody Valentine 3D, and Drive Angry 3D. I don't think that's the direction they're going to yeah, go. Yeah, I was going to say, I kind of like Jason X, I won't lie, but they're not the people oh, yeah. you go to when you want deep characterization. I mean, Drive Angry 3D had a scene where Nicolas Cage is having a hellfire gunfight while fucking a woman. I mean, we've all been there. Oh, yeah. I'm not expecting taste. No. I'm expecting it to be goofier and sillier. Which could be a valid choice. In its own right, it could be an interesting way to go. Obviously, they're going to bring back Michael. I'm curious how. I'm going to be curious if Laurie is in this. Yeah. I'm curious because I know nothing about the plot. I know it's Halloween 3D and I know the people who made it. I'm genuinely curious. Like, I don't love the zombie verse, but I feel invested in enough now that I'm curious to see where it would have gone. So we'll be back. Good night, everybody. You can't see it, but my hands are coming into your face. Love hurts. (laughs) Love scars. (laughs) Good night, Noel. Good night. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. <laughs>